Okay, so uh, what I wanted to take up uh, this morning is uh, what exactly is Anglo-Dutch liberalism? I mean, Lynn identifies it as the historic enemy of the United States, uh, but ironically, it is one of the dominant or the dominant um, economic system uh, in the world today uh, and, in, and, and emphatically within the United States. <clears throat> and the irony of that is the fact that America was literally founded as a fight against Anglo-Dutch liberalism, literally. Now, Graham Lowry, in his book, uh, How the Nation Was Won, has a very precise uh, uh, discussion that, that the United States was founded as an actual counter-attack, literally, against Anglo-Dutch liberalism, by that name. In other words, this idea of Anglo-Dutch liberalism, you think Lynn t sometimes coins a phrase? This is not a coined phrase, <laughs> right? Uh, they self-identify historically <coughs> as Anglo-Dutch liberalism. What, what was it? Specifically, what happened in England was, and I'll go through this, I, I just want to identify the broad scope of it and then go through the details of it, uh, is that William and Mary, uh, William uh, of Orange from the Netherlands, which is the Dutch side of the Anglo-Dutch liberalism, was asked by the Venetian party, and, and they later became known as the Venetian party, right? Uh, which was the uh, the Whigs, they were called the Whigs, um, asked William to, they overthrew the Jacobite uh, king, James II, who was a, a uh, a Catholic, right? Uh, and um, they overthrew him. He was the lawful heir to the throne of England. And they brought in a, 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 a I don't know, Calvinist Protestant king called William, who was not English. Right? He was the first English king that wasn't English. Okay. Um, and they brought him and his wife, who was the daughter of James II, who was, who should have been the heir to the throne. His daughter should have been the heir to the throne, which is Mary, because she was born in England. She was the. If you're going to overthrow him, the succession would be to his daughter, right? But that's not that's not what happened. William of Orange was brought in to the throne of England okay, by the Venetian party of England. I, I, I don't just use that lightly. That's what they were later known to be. Okay, um, and, uh, and they put William on the throne. Okay, And then you had the succession of the German kings, the Hanoverians, which were George I, George II, and the well-known well, to Americans, George III, right? Hanoverian? Hanoverian from Hanover, right? Okay. So when you say Anglo-Dutch, <laughs> right? This is you know you're not really coining a phrase, right? It's Anglo-Dutch. It's literally Anglo-Dutch, right? And they and they call their philosophy under Adam Smith liberalism. Mm. So it's Anglo Dutch liberalism. Uh, in other words, no one could argue, right? No one literate. I mean, there are a lot of illiterate people. I mean, they they can say any goddamn thing, right? But I mean, no one literate who knows anything about history could argue there's such a system called Anglo Dutch liberal system. It was known by that name. It's written by that name, right? 
uh, and this Anglo-Dutch liberal system was the system that was overthrown by the American Revolution. That is not debatable by anyone. I mean, that, that's simple, that's straight, this is no irony, no subtlety. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what it, that's what happened. Okay? Uh, in other words, it, it, what, what we're saying is not arcane, it's just that everyone's illiterate. <laughs> okay? It's not a strange thing we're saying. Right? It's just, you know, illiteracy. Right? About the American system. Because the American system was a revolt against the Anglo-Dutch liberal system. Okay? As I said, there's nothing to the imagination on this side of it. Okay? This is direct. And Graham Lowry, uh, in his book, How the Nation Was Won, has a brilliant exposition. You know, I, I, I was rereading it um, uh, for the class, but also for myself, really. I periodically reread it. Uh, and um, this guy is... In, I mean, Lynn was not kidding. This guy is was. I mean, he is and he was, right? A, a brilliant historian. I mean, I, I mean, the little touches, the little grace notes, you know, yeah. that he puts in, the little cultural grace <coughs> notes that he puts into this thing. This is a guy, these people were real. It's an unfolding drama. I mean, it's written as a, a classic drama with a happy ending. Uh, <laughs> not a tragedy. It's a heroic, uh, it's a heroic thing. Uh, uh, and uh, and the grace notes of who these Anglo-Dutch liberals were, right? But I just wanted to establish that because because that side of it only you know I, I, I sometimes marvel at the amnesia, right? What causes this amnesia? And how could you not? I mean, how do you not know at least this? Okay, that the American Revolution was organized against the Anglo-Dutch liberal system. How could you not know that? Okay, I mean, how could not every single class in history of the American Revolution start with that? I marvel at it. I, I, I'm sometimes, you know, astounded <laughs> at, at the historic amnesia. Amnesia is a nice word, right? <laughs> at, 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 at the crap that's being taught in school. Okay. All right. And again, I said we established this in the uh, 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 irrefutably uh, in the uh, book that Graham has written. Okay. What is not established, although uh, not, w w which is not, which is somewhat historically fascinating and ironic, right, is where did Anglo-Dutch liberalism come from? In other words, the fact of Anglo-Dutch liberalism and the ascension to the English throne by a Whig Venetian party hmm, to bring, that is established. Okay. What is not established, which I'm going to go through in some detail, right, and then we'll get back to this subject, right, is what is what is this angle? Where did that come from? Right. In, in other words, it, we know it happened. We know we had an American Revolution against it. We know it was a disaster for England and everyone else. I mean, as a system, right? Uh, you know, this was colonialism. This was this became British colonialism. This became the destruction of India. This became the destruction of Ireland. This became the, dis the attempted destruction of the United States. Right? In other words, its history is well known. Okay? And presumably, you know, except for people like Kissinger, uh, it, at least they're ashamed of it. You know? <laughs> well, some guys really you know, are unhinged, right? But, but uh, you know, at least some people are ashamed of it. You know, or, or at least they can't get away with it openly, right? Um, okay. So, uh, so the question is, where does this come from, right? Because in order to know the character of the enemy, you have to know its characteristics, right? Where, where does this come from? In other words, what, I'm, what we're saying about Anglo-Dutch liberalism, as I said, is not refutable, 
is no, no competent history, just a simple straight <laughs> exposition, right, could deny that. But where does it come from? That, that's the issue that I'm going to be taking up today, and then we'll get back to it in terms of its implications, and we can open up for discussion. Right? Okay. Now, we we know that the um, that the collapse of the Roman Empire, right, which was based on slavery and looting, right. It collapsed not so quickly. It collapsed first in the West, in Rome itself. But the actual um, Roman oligarchy under Constantine split Rome before Rome collapsed. In other words, Rome was being overrun by uh, different tribes, right? The different. Um, Celtic and related tribes, you know, from uh, also from uh, very much from what was France at that point, what, what became later France, right? Uh, Gaul, it was called Gaul, and it was being overrun by these tribes, right? Um, uh, but in the West, uh, Constantine, who later set up Constantinople, set up a, a, a the, the seat of the Roman Empire was, was in one in Latin Rome and uh, the other seat was Constantinople. And one of the reasons they chose Constantinople, it was extremely defensible. There was water on three sides. And what they did was they built up a massive rampart on the land side and they they had and they had to have a fleet. A major fleet, so that no one, no land force could invade. Uh, you'd have to invade by sea, right? And therefore, they su- they survived and became the the center and the seat of the Roman Empire, right? Now, as that collapsed, right, Venice, which ultimately in 1204 physically did the deed, although they had destroyed it way before, right? But they physically invaded Constantinople and actually killed during the Crusades, which which we'll get to. The Crusades was a big farce. It was a joke. It had nothing to do with anything but ultramontane Venetian power, right? Uh, But anyway, so they invaded in 1204 Constantinople and took the place over by sea, right? Uh, uh, Did they actually have an army, uh, army or a navy? Sure, they had a navy and a marine corps. But what they used was the Norman chivalry, which is what I'll get to, right? That, that, that is the point, by the way. It was, a, it was a combination, the physical overthrowing of the Byzantine Empire, right? was a combination of the Venetian power along with the Norman chivalry which, which created the land forces for the invasion and destruction of Constantinople. When did they do that? 1204. This is, this is at the height of the Crusades. Right. Okay. So, uh, so, so, but before then Venice had become the major power. In other words, often the last act of the collapse of an empire is it, it being overthrown. That's not the first act, right? It's usually the last act. Of, it's the final, what they say, coup de grace. You know what I mean? It's weakened, it's weakened, it's weakened, right? Uh, uh, and of course, all empires are insane, <laughs> right? I mean, every single empire in history has been destroyed by its own internal contradictions. Right, because it's based upon the looting of not only its own population, right, because that that's bad enough, but it's based on the looting of other populations to maintain the empire. Because there hasn't been an empire in history that has not been based upon looting and slavery, enslavement of other people's from the Roman Empire to the Byzantine Empire to the Venetian Empire to the British Empire it it really has massive internal (coughs) contradictions 
because it, it, it defies the laws of the universe because the universe is based upon mankind's ability to hypothesize and, and uh, be creative and on the basis of that creativity increase the relative potential population density through technologies you know that that has that is just the laws of the universe and whenever you violate that right the results are always disastrous always not you know there are no empires left in fact what we're seeing now is the end of the Anglo-Dutch liberal empire. That's what you're actually, if one were to take a broad strategic view of this, right? This is not, a, this is not an economic collapse, right? This is a collapse of an empire. Mm-hmm. It's in the, it, 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 it has that characteristic, right? Okay, and out of these empires, the last collapse during the Dark Ages actually brought in... Not, not objectively, because collapses don't always bring in objective circumstances. Sometimes they bring on dark ages, right? But if you have the proper leadership out of those collapses, the last renaissance occurred, right? With the collapse of the actual Ven- first phase of the Venetian Empire, right? Um, you, you actually had the renaissance. Okay. So, so what... Ch- so what you have, right, with the collapse of the Byzantine Empire is the rise of the Venetian Empire. And as I said, the Byzantine Empire, the last act of the Byzantine Empire was the invasion of the Normans under Vene- with Venetian ships, right, invaded and destroyed uh, about 14,000 people the Great Crusades, they killed more Christians in the Great Crusades than they did Muslims or Jews, right? They actually killed more Christians during the Crusade. The Albigensian Crusade, the other Crusades, they actually killed Christians. This was crap. It had nothing to do with Muslims, it had nothing to do with Jews, it had nothing to do with Jerusalem. They only made it to Jerusalem once. And then they, when they took it over, they had to give it back. Saladin uh, 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 took it back, right? Defeated them. And they never got back to Jerusalem again. They invaded everything else, uh, mainly Christians. It, it was about power. It was about establishing Venetian power and ultramontane power over these different um, uh, areas. Right? That's what the Crusades were about. Now, uh, okay, so, so now you have, after... Uh, at the end of this process, at 1204, is the last coup de grace administered by the Venetians and the Normans to the Byzantine Empire. It, it hangs on for a little while, but not much longer. Right? And in fact, it, it was uh, the, colla- the ultimate collapse was uh, 1450. Uh, the Byzant- literally, physically, where the Turkish, uh, uh, Seljuk Turks took Byzantium in about 1450, which is Kuza was trying to stop. Kuza and the <coughs> Renaissance were trying to reestablish something. Um, but and, and, and that is a whole other story, the Seljuk Turks. And, and that is a different... Uh, they, they work with the Venetians. In fact, the Venetians opened the gates in the 1450s to the Seljuk Turks. The what? Seljuk? Seljuk. S-E-L-J-U-K. Mm-hmm. Right? They were not like uh, Harun al Rashid. You know, Harun al Rashid and the Baghdad Caliphate were a completely different um, kettle of fish. These, these were real humanists. You know, these, these were actually more advanced. I mean, I mean, he was much more advanced the, 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 in the 800s when, when Harun and Al Mamun, his son and the father, it was three generations. In the Baghdad Caliphate, the center of world culture and politics and physical economy was where Baghdad is today. And that's just the truth. In the 800s, much more advanced than Western culture and Western, much more advanced. And that's why he had to give. He was trying to create. I mean, actually, Harun al Rashid was trying to create something with uh, um, Charlemagne, and, and so Harun said to Charlemagne, look, I'll give you Jerusalem, build you up. 
with the church, right? Because he was the Holy Roman Emperor. So he said, I'll build you up with the church. I'll give you Jerusalem, but I'm worried if you send too many troops here, you'll screw up your ability to hold the Western Empire. So I'll see, I'll just give it to you, and we'll collect rent and other things from and send you the money, right? I, I, Harun al-Rashid is a fascinating subject in itself. Right? Yes. Uh, Harun al-Rashid. Uh, uh, yeah. What, why were they called soldiers? I don't know. I, I, honestly, I don't know that history. Uh, you know, it's only so much I can sort of get. You know, I, I mean, it's a sort of interesting. But uh, anyway, so the Seljuk Turks by 14, 15, four, uh, 1450 took over the Byzantine Empire. As I said, Venice, Venice became the center of the of the empire, right? Uh, that again is nobody would dispute that, but nobody knows what Venice is. Okay, that is where you get into disputes. Okay, uh, you know because there are history books written, you know, uh, you know about this and, and that kind of thing. Where would you get into the dispute? What was Venice? Okay. Now um, we've done a lot of work on this. I'll just uh, one of the most uh, valuable discussions. Actually, is not published. Hmm. Anyway, uh, <laughs> if you're interested, I'll get it to you. Uh, Al Douglas wrote a, a brilliant piece on on what is Venice, right? Uh, but I'll give you sort of the broad outlines of it, um, because it, it, because it, what Venice was, it, it started out as a maritime power. Right, that, that uh, what happened with the collapse of Rome in the West, Rome itself, physically Rome, right? The Venetian, the Roman, the Romans who were escaping the collapse of Rome escaped to this uh, famous uh, lagoon of Venice, right? It's it's in the northern Adriatic, right? It's the lagoon, basically. Uh, and they uh, uh, there's actually one of Verdi's operas called Attila uh, it references this not, Venetian not Attila? Attila, Attila the Hun Attila the Hun, yeah Attila, it's a very good opera by the way very interesting uh, Attila, A-T-I-L-L-A uh, it's about Attila the Hun and it has this funny irony about who Attila really was actually um, but uh, but anyway, um, they escaped. The Venetians, or Venice didn't exist. It was the so-called noble Roman families, right? Uh, escaped Attila taking over Rome, and or, or just before these tribes taking over Rome, and they they went to Venice, and they were able to hold on these islands in, in the lagoon. They were able to hold it militarily. Mm -hmm because no one could evade it from the, the, the barbarians or the pagans, could not invade from land. Okay, So they built up a massive fleet uh, and they became very famous for what was called the Venetian Arsenal, uh, which was a, a they had, 30, at the height of the arsenal they had 13,000 workers. They could put out a ship a day. It was it was a massive arsenal, right? Uh, and therefore, they became the dominant commercial military. Uh, I mean, not commercial, a commercial mercantile power. What does that mean exactly? Right? They controlled, and they were very close to Byzantium. Okay, they 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 looked eastward. They did not look toward the west because actually as I said the, the growth of civilization was mainly in the east not in the west it's only chauvinism western chauvinism to say it was in the west these guys were eating with forks and knives when most of Europe was, was eating with their fingers you know, uh, and not very well <laughs> Uh, 
<laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, you look at Baghdad, it was an extraordinary development, actually. Uh, but anyway, so the so Venice was mainly a trading route from the east to the west. You know, they brought in spices, they brought in cloth, they brought in the actual fruits of the labor of the Eastern world, right? Which, which, uh, after the 800s, was dominated by the Muslim world, right? Um, uh, they brought those to the and China, you know, the famous Silk Road. The, the Venetians controlled those trade routes, and they were the the mercant the mercantile class that. Uh, uh, disseminated the, the, these goods from the east to the west, okay? And the west was barbaric at that point, right? It was, it was barely around. All right, now, um, and the rise of the west, of course, goes slowly. I gave a class year, about a year ago on the question of Augustine and the development of the Irish monks and the monastery movement and the development of the west. That's how it happened, right? All right. So, uh, so anyway, so 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 that's what Venice was in its initial phase, right? And as they built up this mercantile capability and the trading capability, they built up around it banks. Okay, <laughs> you know. Now, ba banks were known in Rome and other places, but not these kind of banks, right? <laughs> Uh, and the actual, and you'll find this very interesting, the actual center of the banking interest, this is Al's report, and, and there are books on this, uh, the actual center of Venetian banking interest was the church at St. Mark, St. Mark's <laughs> Cathedral. Right? In the basement of St. Mark's right, was the banking center of, of Western Europe. What's Saint Mark's? What makes Saint Mark's yeah, yeah. special? Saint Mark's. Well, it's a hilarious story. I just tell it just because you know, if, if Grammy did grace notes, I could do a little grace note here and there. Uh, <laughs> uh, the the, the, uh, the bones of Saint Mark, who was one of the apostles, right, were found in Jerusalem, and uh, the Venetian traders. Uh, uh, got the bones of St. Mark and brought it to Venice as their patron saint. Right? There, there was a lot of mysticism involved in the church at that point. Right? Uh, and, um, and the way they got it off of the island, uh, out of Jerusalem because there was a lot of uh, uh, police around to make sure that people weren't stealing stuff from Jerusalem particularly artifacts, like the bones of saints and other things, right? uh, is, is they, they packed it in pork. And, and oh, wow. Pork, right, in a barrel of pork. Saint Mark Jewish? No, no, but the Muslims didn't eat pork. No, the Muslims didn't eat pork. So when they opened the barrel, you know, I the, 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 just close it, forget it. Just, yeah. anyway, anyway so, so they brought the bones of St. Mark back to Venice, right? Uh, I mean, they were crazy too. Don't kid yourself. Oligarchs are pretty crazy, uh, right? Uh, and uh, 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 so they brought the bones back, uh, and they founded a church based on these bones, which became the central church of of Venice. Was the the you know cathedral of of Saint Mark? Okay. In the basement of the cathedral of Saint Mark were, were called the procurators of Saint Mark. Right, uh, and and they were the single most powerful body in Venice. Right, what was it called again? procurators of Saint Mark. Right, that was an official title. And and what would happen is the families, the oligarchical families of, and and this is the first rule by oligarchy. And without a king, they didn't have a king. Venice was uh, was a very strange place, right? Uh, the ruling families set up a senate, okay, and and you could not participate in the senate except if you were from one of the ruling families, right? Uh, uh, and there were I think 300 families 
you have, they have the names of it, right, of these families, right? And if you were born into that family and you were a male, right, um, you, but you were a senator, officially, okay? And out of this Senate, uh, 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 they did not allow kings. Uh, they had what was called a doge, hmm. right? Uh, and the doge was the elected by the Senate, okay? And it was a very complicated procedure. Uh, and you had to have a majority of the Senate elect the doge. The doge served for a lifetime, right? But the doge could not act except with the council of three, right? And the council of three was rotating, as was the council of ten, every year. So the three were chosen by the ten, right? Yeah. Would this council uh, come from the co curators? Well, that's where I'll get to the point. Yeah. Um, uh, but but you know you could serve every year if you were elected uh, in the ten or the three, but you had to get elected every year, right? And very often there would be power shifts and other things going on, right? Uh, uh, the Doge was not like a president. The Doge was merely one of the Council of Three, okay, and he did ceremonial things, but he had no independent power. Except now, the Council of Three were, was capable of uh, uh, issuing a death sentence against anyone in Venice for any reason, okay, and it was to the Council of Three that the vast vast army of um, of spies right reported okay and this is what Schiller if you, if you understand this system you'll understand the ghost seers everything on the surface is not what it appears to be that's why Venice became very famous uh, both made famous by Shakespeare in the famous uh, plays he wrote, Merchant of Venice and um, Othello, of course, and of course uh, the um, uh, it was Merchant of Venice, Othello, and there was one other play, I forget. Oh, Marlowe wrote Jew of Malta, which was like Venice. Um, but I, wasn't there another play? Anyway, definitely The Merchant of Venice and Othello, right, w written about that. Um, and of course Schiller's famous Ghost Seer is probably the most brilliant study. I gave a class on that years ago on, on the Ghost Seer. Because if you want to know Venice, if you really want to know how Venice worked, you read the Ghost Seer. G O G H O S T S E E R. If you really want to know how it works, and it's a puzzle. It's a puzzle. And, it, and, 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 and the first time you read it, the first time I read it, and got to the end of it, I realized I had no idea what I had read. <laughs> the ending is so shocking, is so ironic, is so impossible that you realize everything you read before, right, you were fooled. If you start with a set of assumptions, what you see is what you get, you're fooled. Right? I mean, she, I mean what, what Schiller does is he takes you through the process of Venice, not just merely not just merely a description of Venice, but the actual core of Venice, right? Uh, okay, now, the... Uh, so they didn't have a king. They had a ruling families. Now, the procurators of St. Mark, the, every family deposited their funding, their funds, in the bank of the procurator of St. Mark's. It, it's very reminiscent, which I'll get to, of the cult of Apollo at Delphi, right? Because what you get in this kind of thing is the fact that the, <coughs> the cults run the banking system. The oligarchical cults, well, the oligarchical cult leaders, right, 
run the banking system. Mm-hmm. This this was very clear in the case of the cult of Apollo at Delphi, right? Uh, so anyway, so you have um, the procurators were the most powerful families in Venice, and that that was elected for life, right? Yeah. And they and they would change, right? But you had to die before you or got killed. I mean, if the three didn't like you, it would be a, a fight on who would who would survive, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, it doesn't mean that oligarchical societies really agree with each other. These are lunatics, right? They're they're mad, power mad lunatics, right? So you had to have the Council of Three because because in order to keep these lunatics in line, you had to have a power above them that could kill them. <laughs> right? I mean, that's how you, I mean that's really how you yeah 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 fail safe mechanism right I mean it, it, it was, you know so so you, you, but it was a highly organized oligarchy it was a, it was the most organized oligarchy in human history okay no question about it you had oligarchs all over Europe but they were like the Norman chivalry I mean. I mean, if you want to know Norman chivalry, I gave a class years ago about Norman chivalry from Shakespeare's standpoint. That was Norman chivalry. It was literally Norman chivalry because it was the Normans who invaded England and imposed the the system, the codes of honor and the systems in England. Now, this was a bunch of lunatics. I mean, they were always skewering each other, uh, you know, disemboweling each other. this, This was just sport. You know, yeah. All the English kings, as of 1066, were Normans. And, and in, um, in Shakespeare, like that one scene, uh, the red and the white rose. And oh yeah, sure, yeah. Oh yeah, this is yeah. But they were all Norman. Forget it. Red rose, white rose, Plantagenet. There was only one brief period of. T- yeah, it was a brief period of less than a hundred years, which established England as as a commonwealth. And, and actually created the United States. I mean, I mean, it wasn't a whole long time, okay? But it was a very brief period of time where where we had ascendancy uh, after Henry the Seventh, and actually this this country was founded, uh, which Graham is just brilliant. I, I just can't say enough about how brilliant that book is. Um, but anyway, uh, so you had the procurators. Right, and these were the oligarchical families deposited their funds, and these guys charged rent. They would lend money to the state for war, right, and they would get a nice return, um, right? Uh, 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 you know, and then they were the on the Rialto was an actual bank. Rialto was the I don't know if you've ever seen Venice. I should probably bring a picture someday. Uh, it's sort of a strange place. It's, it's, it's really the architecture is strange. It's very eastern. You know, they have these funny minarets. These funny. I don't know how to describe it. They they call minarets. It's a funny uh, globes on top of their churches. It looks very eastern. It is very eastern, right? Um, uh, but on the Rialto, which is the docks and the. Uh, 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 they had in the trading centers they had the, the, the first Banco de Giro which was the first bank ever created where you could deposit you deposit an initial amount of money in Venice and it, a corresponding bank in Byzantium right, you, no money would have to change hands just notes, you know, they were credit letters of exchange, credit these kinds of things were invented by the by the Venetians, right? Um, paper money, you know this kind of thing. They also coined all money in Western Europe and East and the East. All coinage of money, which which uh, uh, Al Douglas has done a fascinating study of, um, was run through Venice. It, it, they the in the East. Was uh, was uh, gold, and in the west was si- uh, silver, mm. right? Mm. Now what Venice did was <coughs> change the east to gold. Uh, I mean, uh, change the east to silver, and the west to gold, and they controlled the monetary supply of both. 
through coinage. Right? It's a whole other story, which is very fast. And the Bank of England, that was the first thing they did, was they changed the coinage of England. Very Venetian. Literally Venetian. Right? Uh, and then, then the Venetians would speculate on the ratios of gold to silver. And the prices, they would set the prices of gold and silver. And remind you of something? <laughs> you know, the IMF... You know, you know, you set the the prices of things in gold, or set it in silver. You devalue silver because you want the, you want the gold to go up. Then you speculate on gold, and then you devalue gold, and you get the silver to go up. This this was a later phase of Venetian uh, uh, existence, right? But initially, they were a, a, a mercantile power. They were officially an oligarchy. Officially, in other words, if you were to ask what form of government Venice had, they would say it's an oligarchical form. Though it was very interesting, they called it a republic. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this became very interesting because since they didn't have a king, they called themselves a republic. It was called Serenissima Repubblica, right? The, the Serenissima. Right, which is the Serene Republic of Venice. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so you had that. Then, now, by themselves, they had no physical... They, they, they were on the seas, they were unchallenged. But they couldn't do anything on land. They, were, they, they could never... They, they lost every battle they ever fought on land. Right? Uh... They had to hire mercenary armies and other things. They had to have the Norman chivalry. Right? Now, what, who were the Normans? The Normans were a bunch of Vikings who settled in northern France, later called Normandy. or, or Right? Later called Normandy. It was just northern France at that point. Right? Um, and they... The Normans uh, were basically a military culture, right? Uh, uh, they basically didn't farm. Uh, they they didn't do mercantile stuff. Uh, they basically killed people. <laughs> okay, that's what they did. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, Vikings did those kinds of things. Right? Uh, uh, they were a raiding culture. It was a pretty degenerate group. Right? Um, I, I, I got to tell you, one of the books I read was hilarious. Uh, I knew this was the book I had to read. It was. Uh, uh, I forget the name of it. I'm not recommending you read it, but the picture is worth a thousand words. The guy who wrote it was on a horse. I mean, you know how you have the flap jacket where the guy's just standing there. It's usually a demure picture of a professor who wrote it, or and the biography. Well, this guy's on a horse with mail coat, you know, riding on top. <laughs> this guy. This is the book I got to read. <laughs> And he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> My kind of guy, right? You know, he lives. He lives his history, right? <laughs> crazy as a man. The guy was crazy as a man. Crazy as a man. But he was telling the truth. Yeah, yeah. But he was telling the truth, right? Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, mean, I was looking through the other books. And said, no, this one's not going to be academic. You know, this one's going to be real. Uh, <laughs> so the Normans settled in not for long by the way settled in what was later called Normandy or northern France right they immediately migrated south to um, uh, to what later became Sicily right but they, they migrated to southern Italy they didn't invade Sicily till later which was Muslim right mm -hmm. And you're talking about 700, 800 A.D., right? 800? 7 to 800 A.D., when they said, when the first Normans invaded and, and actually were given land 
in northern France, right? They, the Vikings, the they, they were Vikings originally, but they settled in northern France. Mm -hmm. What can I say? They were Normans. I don't know okay. what they call themselves. Um, I don't know why. Um, they, by 1066, they had decided in coordination with the with da with the Danes who lived in what was called Britain at that point, or England at that point. They had invaded England with William the Conqueror in 1066, right? The Normans. The Normans. The, the, in other words, <coughs> the Saxons who were Christianized by St. Augustine, or the Augustinian orders, which was P Patrick, Columba, Columbo, it was two, Columba, and, and yeah, Yes, and Columbine. Mm -hmm. There were there were three. <coughs> they were they were Christianized, and they were actually Christian, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the the Normans were I don't know what, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they later became the great Christian crusaders. The Norman chivalry became the great Christian uh, uh, looters, you know, which which Rabelais has incredible fun with. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, Rabelais <laughs> is writing about the Norman crusaders. Huh. That's w because they all became monks. In other words, in order to go on on a crusade to kill everybody in sight, particularly Christians, right? Uh, you had to become a, a part of a religious order, like the Knights of Saint John, the Knights of Jerusalem, uh, you know, Knights of Malta, right? They were all monks. They were all religious leaders, right? You know, which Rabelais has a lot of fun with, you know, with, with Friar John and the way Friar John kills. 20, 30,000 people with his, with the cross, right? <laughs> and all of them Christian, by the way. And and deserve to be killed, too, that, which was even funnier. <laughs> I mean, Rabelais is unbelievable. If you know the history, you, you realize what Rabelais is doing. Um... So the Norman Crusaders invade uh, England and, and overthrow the Saxons, who were actual Christians, right? And they establish what was what Shakespeare identifies as the, as the Norman chivalry, right? Which was the pre proclivity toward being crazy, and every English king was pretty crazy, except for Henry the Seventh, right? Every English king was really strange, right? and, and some argument could be made on Henry V, but that's ironic. Uh, Shakespeare means Henry V very ironically, right? There's a tremendous irony involved in Henry V, though, though he means it seriously. All good good ironies are serious, right? Um, because Henry VI comes later. Well, Henry VI comes later, of course. Yeah, right after Henry V. That his son, who supposedly has a claim to the throne of France, but does not have a claim to the throne of France, it's crazy. The whole arrangement is crazy, right? Um, and the whole war that Henry the Fourth fit was crazy. Fought was crazy. Henry the Fifth. Okay. He invades France. Yeah. Remember the Agincourt. Yeah, right. right. Um, so anyway, so um, so the Norman chivalry not only take over England, they took, take over southern Italy. In this, they were actually much more dangerous than what they had done in England, right? Because it was the Norman chivalry of southern Italy that became the core of the Crusades. They later invade Sicily and kill the Muslims in Sicily, right? Before the Crusades were announced, right? So. So and they become the martyr lords, and this this is the key on this thing. They become the martyr lords, the the military force for the Latin Church, okay, and the Ultramontane, which I'll get to now, right? In, in other words, they had to. The Byzantine Church was a complicated matter, right? Because you see, some of the great Platonists, remember the Greek works of Plato were brought to the Council of Florence from the Byzantine Church. Okay, it was not... In the West, they didn't have it. So they, they, the actual writings of Plato 
while translated predominantly by the Muslims in the 800s, the, the Al-Mamun, Harun al-Rashid, and others. The works of Plato, and unfortunately Aristotle, but other Greek thinkers, were actually first translated into Arabic, and then retranslated into Latin. Because they were much more advanced culture. I think we should get out of this idea, right? It's just, it's just Cheney bullshit, right? And, and, and Norman chivalry bullshit, and Venetian <laughs> bullshit about, about the Muslims and, and that culture, right? Um, so, uh, so anyway, so, uh, <coughs> so the Byzantine church was complicated. It was it was crazy also, right? Remember, this was the how did it become crazy? This is where this ultramontane question comes from. The Constantine, as I told you, founded obviously Constantinople, right? Uh, <coughs> now he realized that you couldn't be, and Diocletian attempted. To have uh, um, the the uh, West, which was his father Diocletian uh, attempted to create a, a pagan and a Christian allowed the Christians and the pagans to sort of coexist, right? Uh, but Diocletian realized that the Christians were too powerful. The idea of Christianity was too powerful. I'm not talking about real Christianity. I'm not talking about what later they, they did. Right? But you know, the apostolic Christianity was one of the most powerful cultural forces in history. There's no question about it. I don't think anybody should play games on this question. Right? Um, well, we know that. We know that from Augustine. We know that from you know, how the West got developed. Right? All right. So, <coughs> so they had to co-opt because they couldn't stop it. They couldn't militarily stop it. The more they killed the Christians, the more martyrs they made, and the more Christians joined. And that, that's what Diocletian attempted to do. So Constant, Constantine right, tries to reestablish Christianity as the religion of the, of the, of the, West, of the Eastern Church. Right? Uh, uh, now, what what was his Christianity? Well, he was a he was like a Norman noble nutcase, right? Do you, I mean, do you realize his actual description of how he became a Christian? I'll tell you it because it, it captures Constantine's Christianity. Um, he had to battle against one of his brothers, right, uh, in order to establish the Roman Empire. Him being the single leader of the Roman Empire, right. So he had to kill one of his brothers. Not his brother. I mean, they had to opposing armies had to fight. So he has a dream the night before the battle, in which he sees a cross, right? And he he has on the sh and he says, and and he in this dream he says, under this sign we shall conquer. That was his dream, right? So he had all his guys wear crosses on their shields, right? Uh, and they won. Now, this is not really Christianity, in my view. Right? <laughs> I, I just don't see that as a, a real good reason. You know? <laughs> and it's probably a bullshit story, too. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think what happened was that Diocletian could not wipe out apostolic Christianity. And they had to come to terms with it by co-opting it. And making it a state religion. You mean yeah. Well, Diocletian first realized that they couldn't wipe it out militarily, because the more martyrs they made, the more Christians they made. Sort of like trying to wipe out Islam by by killing yeah. Muslims. I, I, I mean, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. Wasn't Diocletian the one that said that you, the son, has to do what the father did? Yeah. Right. Yeah. This was the code of Diocletian. Uh, the laws. Yeah, oh, well, Diocletian didn't make any bones about being a Christian. He was a pagan. His son Constantine was the so-called Christian. 
Now, <laughs> but he did what his father did. <laughs> yeah, right. right, right. <laughs> but but no, because so what they did was they created what was called the ultramontane, right? It's it sort of it, it sort of comes from Constantine, the donation of Constantine, in which presumably, which by the way was later turned out to be a forgery, right? But presumably. Uh, Constantine said, well, the church has power over the temporal authority. Right? The, the, in his donation of the Roman Empire to the church. Right? And the Pope. Right? So that the Pope would have authority over all temporal authority. Right? Which, of course, Christ said the opposite. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar. Render unto God what is God. It's a totally different view. Right, uh, but anyway, so you had a um, so so. But and by the way, it was a forgery. It was forged by the papacy, the, the Latin Church. It was forged. It was later discovered, four hundred years later. Right, uh, as the as the argument that the papacy was the controlling power and no temporal authority, no king could buck the temporal authority of the, the temporal authority of the church. Okay? N not the spiritual authority, but the temporal authority of the church. And that's where the Holy Roman Emperor and all sorts of other things was was the battle from Charlemagne forward was that the, the temporal authorities have to be in the hands of the kings. Right? And uh, and and some kings were good, actually, and they were the ones who got wiped out <laughs> by this stuff, right? The the, the uh, Charlemagne and then later uh, the Hohenstaufen kings were actually practiced something like the general welfare for their population, education, a certain uh, living standard. You know, actually had some idea of this, right? Which were proto proto republics or proto potentially republics could grow out of such a thing, right? Um, but didn't work. But it was, they had that tendency, which in fact, in in Dante sided with the Hohenstaufen kings against the papacy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because he thought they were more progressive from the cause of humanity. This was a more progressive force, right? Anyway, so the Venetians, and they had the best intelligence agency in the world at that point. Because the way they organize their intelligence is they, the oligarchical families were scared shit of the three. Okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the only way you could keep these guys in line. Otherwise, they would have ended up Normans. Right? And the Normans just went around killing people, looting, stealing, having a gay old time. Right? <laughs> okay. But the Venetians had to keep it together because they were actually a world power. The Normans were nothing. They they were a bunch of looting gangs. They were gangs, right? Like mafia gangs. Right? Literally mafia because the actual Normans were the ones who did the night of the long nights, the Sicilian Vespers. They were the actual Normans who did that. Right? So they were literally the mafia. They became the mafia. They became Italianized and then they became the mafia. Uh, 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 so, uh, so what happens is that the Venetians take over and run the papacy. They didn't elect a Venetian to the papacy. That was you know, the Venetians. Got to understand Venetian method. Never put your guys out front. Never, because you might give the show away, right? So. So what you had was you had, as I went through, the Norman chivalry, southern Italy takes over England, right? You had the Western Church, uh, the Eastern Church being destroyed by Venice internally through a series of intelligence operations. The center of gravity shifts to the Western Church and the Latin Church, right? 
and the Latin Church is dominated by the donation of Constantine faction, right? Which says that the Church must be a temporal power above kings, so that you have a globalized empire, right? That that the that the the Church revenues, the taxing of the poor, the tithing of the rich, right? All went through the Church and went to Rome. But who were the bankers for Rome? Guess who? The Venetians. Right. Plus, they were epistemologically, they launched the fight to establish Aristotle as the dominant Greek philosopher. Oh, absolutely. They were not, I mean, they're, they're insane, but they're not stupid. Okay. They knew that you had to establish an idea of man that was antithetical to being human. There was oligarchical systems have a characteristic to them, right? And that fundamental characteristic is the denial of humanity to humans, right? That that the elite, the elect, the what they call the uh, uh, the gnosis, right? The gnostics, gnosis, right? Is an elite, an elect has enlightenment. Isn't it interesting they called it the enlightenment? (laughs) (laughs) Right? And that and that through mystical powers the elect get I don't know, I guess enlightened, right? Literally. Right. Uh, And the others are stuck with their senses, right? And that's Aristotle. Aristotle says there are no hypotheses without senses. Right? That it comes your hypotheses come from the bombarding of your physical apparatus and your senses. That's, what, that's Aristotle, right? So the Venetians actually were the ones who consciously through the University of Padua in particular, but in every branch of education, translate and deploy Aristotle throughout Western civilization. That was the other, you know, it's like syphilis, you know, they were exporting <laughs> syphilis, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah. yeah. What, what, like, what's the time period? You're talking now uh, about 1200, 1100, 1200, where they really made the push. And I'll go why. I'll go through why. Okay. Is there any dominant figures in that? Yeah, Paolo Peruta and, and, and the, the educators at, at Padua, right? What, what is this? Padua University was run by the Venetians. It was in Padua. I mean, it's close to Venice. It's Venice is here, Padua is here. Um, but it was the key Aristotelian institution in Western civilization. Right? It was run by Venice. That's, by the way, where this cult business comes from. Right? In, in other words, oligarchism needs cults. Right? Because you need some priest to steal the hell out of people right? <laughs> and, be- and believe that he's doing it for the greater glory of th- these really mythical, I mean, these mythical powers. Because if you really knew an oligarch from the inside, these guys can barely eat with forks. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> these are not really high-level characters, right? <laughs> um, so anyway. Uh, so you so you have these so you have a combination of a globalized empire through the ultramontane through the donation of Constantine, right? Venetian banking power and Norman muscle. Okay, that's the combination that ran the world after the collapse of the Byzantine Empire. That was the combination. How but now, how did they do it? Crusades. See the the, the the Crusades were the the Crusade system was not what you think it is. It's certainly not what they said it was, right? <laughs> because because the Crusades they were trying to say the Crusades were the trying to liberate. I mean when uh, uh, God I forgot now whatever his name was uh, Clement or something preached the first Crusade in 1095. At, at the Benedictine Abbey at Cluny, which is a whole other story. Um, he said, we must liberate Jerusalem. Right? Mm-hmm. That's, that, 
crusades, anyone who will take up the cross will not only be abdicated from any sin they've committed <coughs> in the commission of the act of taking up the cross and invading Jerusalem and giving it back to the Western Church, right? If they, may, if they did sins while they were doing that, they were absolved of that before the fact. <laughs> right? But if they did it, they were absolved of every sin they ever had. They ever did. Right? Uh, so, so, you know, it was a good deal, right? Uh, you, know, you get to commit sins. You're forgiven for everything you've ever done. I mean, you know, anyway. Um, and then you get to steal, kill, loot, pillage, rape. You know, Christianity. <laughs> and, and you're a monk while you're doing it. You've you, you got to understand why Rabelais is so violent on this question. It, it, it is total anathema, right? So, that's what we said. You think I'm joking. You think this is, I'm just making fun of them. Well, I am, but it, it's true. It's actually more true than if you didn't make fun of them. What Rabelais said about the Crusades and its impulse was more true than if you try to give some explanation or some refutation. I mean, that is the refutation. Right? All right. All right, so, uh, so what was it about, though? It certainly wasn't about liberating Jerusalem. As I said, they got there once. They killed... the First, first, first of all, the first people who got killed when they... Uh, you know, everybody's whipped up into a frenzy. We're going to liberate Jerusalem. This is our great mission in life. Right? The first people who got killed were the Jews you know, in Europe. Right? I mean, they just to get... To get into the act, you know, get, you know, get your swinging arm, your axe arm going, right? <laughs> Kill a bunch of Jews, right? Uh, uh, that's true. That is true, right? Because they wanted to loot. They needed money for the damn crusade, so they stole it from the Jews, right? And they killed them, you know, because they were heretics, right? It was a religious frenzy. It was like the, the damn, you know, uh, uh, frenzies that they whip up against. Uh, uh, Muslims now, or you know others, right? So they kill. So who was the first victim of this? The Jews, right? And they stole their money. So that's why I found it so ironic that the ADL was was preaching this crusade against the Muslims, because everyone knows that you know, and liberating Jerusalem was some other crazy place, right? For the Jews, ha ha ha. <laughs> So the oligarchy liberating Jerusalem for the Jews. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we know the history of this thing, right? Um, they're, they're really stupid. I mean, on top of being mean, they're really stupid. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, so, so they got to Jerusalem once. They took it over. They killed like thousands of people. The first crusade, the poor schmucks, the first guys got so crazy and whipped up under Peter the Hermit, they went there without any arms. Oh, <laughs> 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 and they never made it. They, they never made it. I mean, 100,000. Yeah, they died on the way. I mean, it was, I mean, it was just crazy. Uh, they never made. They never had any arms. And then the Normans decided this was serious business, right? Uh, and, 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 and then they put on their mail uh, and, they, and they invade it, right? Uh, and the Normans took over Jerusalem. Then Saladin, after they left, Saladin came and took it back because it was a more advanced culture. <laughs> and they and actually took it back. Right? Uh, and they never saw Jerusalem again. The Crusade never saw Jerusalem again. Right? What was it about? And, and th this is where you get into the, the actual... If you look at Shakespeare, because, again, in these poets, they really understand it better than historians. I mean, you could piece it together, but there's nothing drier <laughs> except for this guy riding his horse with the mail. I mean, he was totally pro-Norman. I've never read a pro-Norman guy in my life. I said, now this, this is different. Right? This is really different. You know? Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, so the, uh, the, sh the poets really understand this best. Right? Uh, and what Shakespeare does is, is indicate very clearly that the, the ultramontane run, as, as I said, Norman chivalry 
is the martial lords Venetian finance mm-hmm. power right they run the the ultramontane donation concept in the business Shakespeare points out in King John and later uh, Henry V that what this was all about these crusades was using the Norman chivalry to crush any king who had any pretensions that they were not going to knuckle under to the, to the ultramontane faction of the church. That's what happened with King John. I mean, it's on some level, you know, Shakespeare is very ironic because what happens is King John. I mean, it's a wild play actually, but King John, who's no, really not a good guy. I mean, it's unbelievable irony. It only takes a poet to really understand this. It's unbelievable irony. He was not a good guy, King John. He was a jerk. Uh, and he usurped the throne. And anyway, he says to the papacy, uh, you're not going to run the Church of England. And this is before they became the Anglican Church, right? Uh, but he said, uh, well, I'll appoint the bishops, right? And so that they'll have some allegiance to the nation. They won't just be a looting colony in our country. Right? <coughs> Uh, so King John, so the in the Shakespeare play, and it's the truth, the 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 papal emissary <coughs> preaches a crusade. This is before the 1095 crusade of uh, of uh, to liberate Jerusalem, the Holy Lands. Um, preaches a crusade against John because he won't listen to Mother Church, right? To the French. So the French king gets whipped up. He figures, God damn, you know, I can grab England again. You know? <laughs> so anyway. Uh, so the French invade. Right? But by then, John, realizing he was going to lose, uh, decides he's going to cut a deal with the papacy. Right? And says to the papal emissary, okay, you can do anything you want. I'm broken. It's yours. So then the papal emissary goes back to the French and says, great, they're with the church. Right? So you guys got to leave. And the French king says, what are you, crazy? Uh, is that, I, mean, what are you, are you, I mean, this is not going to happen. We're going to invade, right? I, I mean, that, and in fact, they did. They lost, though. Uh, but, um, but it shows the duplicity, the unbelievable duplicity of this ultramontane faction of the church. Then, in Henry V, why does he invade France? Right from the beginning, the ultramontane church, the churchmen are conspiring, saying, my God, he's going to seize our lands, he's going to seize our rights here. We've got to get him off. We've got to put him on France. So then they make a ruling on what's called the Salic Law, in which he says that uh, through the mother, Catherine of Henry V, he has claim to the throne of France. And they convince him he has a claim to the throne of France, but it was the church, it was the ultramontane facts of the church, right? And then the crowning irony, just to give you a broad sweep, but give you the crowning irony of the, of the Crusades, right? Which was called the Fourth Crusade, right? In which the Norman nobles all pour into Venice, right? And they, they owe 80,000 <coughs> florins to... These poor schmucks had to pay to get raped, right? <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, so, they, so you know, so uh, 80,000 florins, which they don't have, so they rip off everybody on the crusade to give more, and it still doesn't come out to 80,000 florins. And as they, as they pile on the boat to go to Jerusalem to liberate Jerusalem, right? So the doge of Venice, called Dondolo, says, look, for the, you still owe us 20000 We're not going anywhere. So he busts their chops, right? And the, the, now they're hysterical. Because now they got like 20,000 men you know, in Venice. They can barely feed them. they got to go to the damn crusade. They mobilize everybody. So they're playing hardball. He says, all right. Dondolo said, 85-year-old guy, says, he's blind. Right. the doge says okay you guys if you help me with this problem uh, which is in Zara Z-A-R-A 
right, uh, where they're refusing to pay their tribute to uh, to Venice. Uh, if you help us with this, then we'll go invade the Holy Lands, right? So they pile on the boat, right? Uh, uh, and he said, then I'll forgive the debt, right? So they pile on the boat to invade Zara, right? Okay, so in Zara is the deposed Byzantine, um, uh, the deposed Byzantine emperor, right? Is being held in Zara, and Dandolo, of course, knew that. So, so they get on the boat, they liberate Zara, uh, and the and they said, well, you, you, in order to get to the Holy Land, you're going to have to have to help us invade Constantinople and put this king who had promised massive trade concession to Venice on the throne. And not only that, but when we get, this is the richest city, which it was. It was a, a city of 400,000 people. It's, it, that's enormous. For those days, Venice was only 60,000 people. Wow. Right. This was 400,000 people. They said, my God, if we get through this thing, everyone gets loot, rape, pillage, it's we'll have a good time. You know, <laughs> you steal everything in sight, right? Uh, and, and not only that, you can pay the 20,000 you owe us, right? <laughs> you know. Anyway, so to make a long story short, the Fourth Crusade destroyed the largest Christian city in the world. <laughs> that's I mean, that, that was the Fourth Crusade, right? And that's when Venice stole everything in in the Byzantine Empire and brought it back to Venice. And the famous turrets and the, the lions of Saint Mark were stolen from Byzantium. And brought back to Venice, right? So that was the Crusades, right? To break the power of any temporal authority, to put them under the ultramontane power of, of the corrupt side of the church. Now, of course, you get the Nicholas of Cousas, and you know it's, it's a complicated question, right? But when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about Venetian control, right? <laughs> now, the result of this wonderful. <laughs> Crusades and Crusader system was the Black Death. In other words, the cumulative effect of this looting of the of of these temporal powers and the looting of the world led in twelve uh, no thirteen forty eight to thirteen fifty the cumulative effect of this system led to the Black Death. Uh, 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 of of that of 1348 to 1350, whereas they had so looted England, they had so looted Europe, they had so looted the East, because the the Black Death didn't just hit the Western, it it, it, it swept through China, and Paul Gallagher has an incredible discussion of this, right? Swept through China, through uh, uh, the areas of um, of uh, the the um, um, the Byzantium, but also the, the Muslim areas uh, around Baghdad, it, it killed between one third and one half of the total population of the world. Mm. Right? It was a globalized empire. Mm. The Vene Venetians created a globalized empire right, of ultramontane authority with Norman chivalry as the march rewards. Right? The result of that activity was the destruction of Western and Eastern civilization into a dark age, which ensued. Okay, so these systems are not good; they really don't work. They, in, in other words, that's the punchline, right? Mm -hmm. They really don't work. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not finished, but anyway. Well, you can elaborate on this later, maybe. But I thought also the Mongols. Yeah, right. As the, as the Crusaders, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And they became the Seljuk Turks, <laughs> who, who later take over Constantinople. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, I recommend to read Gallagher's article. Anyway, okay, now what happens? And then, then you see this question of the evolution of, of Venice, right? After the collapse of this system, there arose in the West a revolutionary movement around Nicholas of Cusa, was it called the conciliar movement and later uh, uh, becomes the Council of Florence right um, which was to break the ultramontane control over 
the Christian church. Because in the West, the, the as of 1204, Byzantium wasn't a factor, right? Okay. So, so the Renaissance occurs not because it objectively had to occur because of a collapse. That is not true. It occurred because you had a unique individual who had studied Plato, and, and I was having a discussion with uh, Megan a little earlier on this question, um, who had studied Plato, who had access to it. I don't know exactly how. That's an interesting question. And was a unique genius, Nicholas of Cusa, for a brief period of time through the dialogue on the question of Greek civilization and Plato, and, and actually these Greek texts, the Platonic texts, were brought from Byzantium to the Council of Florence. Cardinal Bessarion was the one who brought the, the, the Greek texts to the Council of Florence right, and discussed the filioque, discussed the idea of, of, the, of man, right, imago dei. And, and you had a great efflorescence through Leonardo da Vinci and then Kepler and others as an offshoot of this great Italian upheaval called the Renaissance. Right? But they also seized power in the church. They broke, for a brief period of time, they broke Venetian control over the church. And the church was actually functioning on the basis of Imago Dei and an idea of man in the image of God and therefore implicitly the general welfare. Implicitly. Right? As a result of those actions, you had the first developments through Louis XI and then later Henry VII in England of this idea of the commonwealth. The idea that it was not a, an oligarchical system in which the oligarchy is the overlords and everyone else is a beast. Right? It was not that. It was something completely different. Right? Venice had to adapt. Unfortunately, they physically survived the dark, the, the Black Death. I mean, they were too evil to be killed, I think. Right? <laughs> yeah. My God, the germs are our friends. Right? Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of them got killed. I mean, Edgar Allan Poe has this Mask of the Red Death, which is I, I recommend you read. It, you really don't. They didn't do that well. <laughs> and they lost power over the church and they lost power over Europe because it was such a dark age in Holocaust, right? But so they so but but they survived and adapted, right? So as as a reaction to the Italian Renaissance, Venice launches the Protestant Reformation. to destroy the church because they had lost power. So they launched the Protestant Reformation. They also launched the Counter-Reformation <laughs> right? under uh, the, the ages of the Jesuits who were founded in Venice by Cardinal Contarini who was the most, uh, the single most powerful family in Venice, right? And he became a, a, a cardinal of the ch of the Western Church, and he he picked up this lunatic mystic called Ignatius Loyola, right? Who was sitting as a um, as a lunatic mystic actually <laughs> uh, in the fountains. Uh, uh, you know, in in, uh, in Venice. I don't know how he ended up in Venice. That's an interesting story. And so Contarini said, boy, this guy's crazy. We, sh we could use him. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, and they found the Jesuit order. So they, they launched the Protestant Reformation through Luther and operations through Luther, through certain Protestant kings, or not, they weren't Protestant kings, but Catholic kings who, were, who they could play Right. Right. Plus, inside the church, they create the Jesuit order to prosecute the Protestant kings who ran Luther. Right. This is Venice. Got to understand, they don't really care what side they're on. They're on all sides: left, right, center. 
as long as they as long as it's not human, <laughs> they're with it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because once you get something like Lynn or Kuza or Leibniz, that's a deadly threat to everything they they mean. Right? You you get these deadly threats because they they harken back to Plato and Socrates and the wellsprings of Western civilization, which is the apostolic Christianity. There is that this is a deadly threat to this to them, and that's the only thing they're scared shit of. Left, right, I mean they don't care. Mount Pelerin Society, Antifa, uh, name it. I, you know who cares? You know that's not a threat. What we represent is a threat, a deadly threat. What Leibniz represented was a deadly threat. What Ben Franklin represented, as we'll get to, was a deadly threat. What the Mathers represented was a deadly threat. Because it was a different idea of man. The fundamentally different idea of man, right? Which represented a, an actual republic as opposed to Serenissima Republica of events, right? Okay. Now, um, okay, so now. So, so they unleash bloodshed through religious war, which they had done during the Crusades. This is an old MO. And they create both the Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Counter Reformation. Running, and this is, by the way, you know, you know, it's not even close. It is well known that the Jesuit order was founded by Cardinal Contarini of Venice. Now, if you close your eyes and read, he, he represented a so-called anti kuza movement inside the church called the e spirituality right? The spiritual ones, right? And it, it's very reminiscent, by the way, of the Gnostics, right? This, this, the spiritual. The e spirituality if you read what they had to say and you read what Luther had to say, he was a spirituality. Luther was a spirituality. Same exact. They mean no works, only faith. Christians are not called on to do any works. They are only saved by grace. Faith, no works. Luther, Contarini. The reform movement inside the church, as a reaction to Cusa, was led. Was called the Easter Was led by the Venetians. And you can, see it's almost verbatim. In fact, during the Council of Trent, which was was called to destroy Luther, they actually said there is no difference between us and Luther, except he doesn't hold to the uh, the magisterium of the church. The, uh, he doesn't hold to the organization of the church and the pope at the top. If he would agree to that, we'd have no problem. That's what that's what that's what Contarini wrote at the Council of Trent. Right? Okay. So so this so so Europe now is embroiled in religious warfare, right? Leading ultimately got out of it by sixteen forty eight in the famous uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Treaty of Westphalia. Okay, now that's the first adaptation. But there was a more profound adaptation because, you see, in 1508, you see, the oligarchs are sort of strange people, as, as I've been trying to get across. Um, they're actually not human. I mean, they have a humanoid form, but they're actually not human. I mean, not all oligarchs, but most of them. Right? Uh, so, what happens is the the Spanish oligarchs and the French oligarchs finally team up and the papacy get pissed off because Venice uh, was screwing everyone, right? Basically, right? Stealing from everyone, all sides, pitting everyone against each other. They finally figured it out. Geniuses after 400 years, right? (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, so what happens is the the um, the uh, they, they team up 
in what was called the League of Cambrai, right? 1508, League of Cambrai. And they crush Venice. And the French were prepared to actually invade the lagoons of Venice and crush them out of existence, which is the only way you could have dealt with this thing. Right? And the ultramontane faction of the church cuts a deal with Venice to call off the invasion of the Venetians. Right? And v- but Venice had the scare of their life. They were about to be physically annihilated. That's hard to come back from. Right? Uh, Even they couldn't figure that one out. Right? <laughs> so, so what happens is that the there, you know, you know, things don't occur at the moment they occur. They often occur fifty or a generation or so later. You know what I mean? You you get a, a, a shock, right? But a generation or two later is when the shock hits, right? You know. It's, it, it, so anyway, what happens? Okay, there becomes a split in the ruling families of Venice. Okay, it was, it was called the Vecchi, which is the old houses, and the Nuovi, or the Giovani, which are called the new houses. It's not that they're not all the same old houses, right? But th- that's for some reason somebody called it that, so let's leave it, okay? Um, now the old houses <coughs> said we got to continue to cut a deal with the church and Spain, the Vecchi, the old houses, right? The new houses, this was in 1580, 1590, said no. There are new mercantile empires emerging now. Well, there are new mercantile powers emerging. One in the Netherlands, one in Britain or England. Right? They have become trading powers. Right? Uh, therefore, the Giovanni said, look, we are physically indefensible right now. We're losing our power as a mercantile power we certainly have lost our military power. Right? We just got, got our ass handed to us, right? Uh, in 1509, right? Uh, so we've got to make a accommodation to this new situation. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, we got these religious wars. Yeah, we got every empire fighting, you know, but it doesn't really take off till much later. In, in the Thirty Years' War takes off in 1618. Right, where it really takes off. It's there, it war, but it really takes off in 1618. Right. Uh, so, so they're making an adaptation, right? And the Giovanni say we must use our intelligence capability, and we must now dominate England and the Netherlands. So, do you understand? This was a conscious decision on the part of Venice, the Giovanni, the new, the new houses, right? That's why it's Anglo-Dutch liberalism. It didn't come out of nowhere. The collapse of the Venetian Empire was the, the it became the Anglo-Dutch liberal hmm. by very conscious design, right? Now, now the battle shifts. Right, Henry the Seventh establishes a republic, as Shakespeare identifies in this famous uh, Richard the Third. Right, he establishes a republic, an idea of man, and then of course you had coming from the Italian Renaissance, you had people like Collett, John Collett, Lineker, Gross, and actually went to Italy and studied Plato at the Platonic Academy and read the ancient Greek and had the old texts. And they come back and form a core around Henry the Seventh, along with Erasmus, who had read the ancient texts, right? Of of Plato and, and Socrates and, and were moved by it. Right? And therefore you have a Renaissance occurring in Tudor England. Right? Not uh, Henry was 
wanted it to happen, but he also wasn't the kind. He, he, he didn't. He couldn't have done it himself, right? You needed these philosophers, and he set up schools and other things, right? And then out of that, the second generation uh, was Thomas More, right? And the third generation was William Shakespeare of this Tudor Renaissance, right? Well, actually, no. It was Thomas More was sort of in between. He was a tweener. And then, <laughs> and then the young generation was Shakespeare, right? Uh, Shakespeare, what he did with his dramas, as was done in uh, in the period of the Greek Renaissance, right, with Aeschylus, Sophocles, it was a mass education institution. In other words, the actual legs that later create this republic. I, I, I call this republic Shakespeare's Revenge. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Uh, at some level because the actual mass educating was done through this process right? through the drama well, both of the oligarchy and of the population they put through the Globe Theater 3,000 people a day 15,000 people a week every month 60,000 people Whoa. London had maybe uh, less than 200,000 people where was this? This was in London. What, what were they doing? They're coming to the theater, the Globe oh, Theater, God, okay. and, and viewing Shakespeare. And how many people lived in London? Maybe 70,000, 80,000. And so there were 60,000 that went through the A week. Theater. A month. Whoa. Now, I, I'm not saying there were repeats, okay? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Some guys lived there, you know. But, uh, but uh, anyway, you, you get the sense of the scale of this thing, right? Um, so this was a mass education institution, right? And the elites of of England were being trained by Shakespeare, as was the and of course the Venetians were freaking out about the whole thing. All right, now now the Venetians make the decision, and, and this, by the way, what I'm going through now is again not refutable. This, this is not this is not it's just illiteracy, frankly, not to know this, right? But Henry VIII, the, who was Henry VIII's advisor on the king's great question? Francesco Zorzi, right? Who was one of the oligarchical families, one of the top 300 oligarchical families of Venice, right? Zorzi also attacks Nicholas of Cusa in the Harmonici Mundi. Right, harmony of the spheres, harmony of the world. Right, and of course Kepler attacks him. Right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and and he's saying, well, Kuz is wrong. Learned ignorance, no such thing as learned ignorance. Right, that you only have your senses, and therefore anyone who and and you can be mystically zapped or something <laughs> but, but, you, but you can't but you can't have knowledge my knowledge doesn't come from the series of higher hypotheses right okay so it's Francesco Zorzi Henry VIII breaks with what he breaks with not just the church but he breaks with Spain because he was married to Catherine of Aragon right the Vecchi wanted the Spanish church thing. The Nuovi wanted a Protestant break-in. Mm -hmm. Even though they were all over the church. Venice is a sweet sweet bunch of guys, right? <laughs> so anyway, so uh, so he breaks, as you know, with the, with the, creates his own church, right? Uh, which he's the spiritual leader and he kills about eight wives as part of being the spiritual leader. He beheads about eight women. Uh, again, uh, not really Christianity. Um, uh huh? The Anglican Church. It becomes the Anglican Church, right? Okay. Then, after his death, who comes back to power? But the Catholics, because remember, he was a Catholic. Everyone was a Catholic. There was no Protestants. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. So, so all of a sudden, Mary, his sister, comes back, and who is her top advisor? Reginald Pole. Reginald Pole was one of the top Phoenician 
families in Venice. No. Venetian family, even though he has a funny English name. Not very Italian. Not very Italian name, but Paul, <laughs> maybe it was Polito, I don't know, whatever. Mm. But, uh, or Polissimo, whatever. Uh, but the point is, top Venetian family is the advisor to the Catholic Mary. And in fact, this guy almost became Pope. This was one of the few times the Venetians tried to put one of their own guys in. Right? And he was a Plantagenet. But remember, the French... It's complicated, but anyway. Um, okay, so then he gets overthrown. Uh, she gets overthrown. Uh, Mary. And Elizabeth comes to power. She's a Protestant. Right? Who's her advisor? Right? <laughs> now, this is where Paolo Sarpi steps in. Right? Because by the end of Elizabeth's reign, her, her initial advisors are the, the Puritan... Not, well, maybe that's the wrong word. Because the Puritans are a very complicated matter. Because the Puritans came here. Right? Uh, but let's call it the, the Calvinist elite. The Calvinist elect. Right? The, the Earl of Leicester, the Earl of uh, uh, several other earls, right, who were attached to the Netherlands, which the Venetians were moving in, right, who set up all the trade. Remember, England now was a, a power, right, and by the 1600s, at the end of Elizabeth's reign, they set up the Levant Company, the Dutch East India Company. The Levant Company later becomes the British East India Company, right, under the Earl of Leicester, and 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 Walsingham and others were the were the uh, Protestant elect, right, who were setting up counterintelligence under Venetian control. Now, now the plot thickens. Paolo Sarpi, right, um, and Lynn has a lot to say about this in this most recent paper. Because, you see, what happens is... Whoa, those guys downstairs drink a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, okay. Uh, the, uh, so, look, the... So, and this is what I concentrated a lot of my work on. Kasarpi, um, who is a Servite monk in the Catholic Church. Servite monk? monk. just S-E-R-V-I-T-E. Some order. Some order inside the Catholic Church. Right. The attack on the Council of Trent and Contarini his own cohort in the Council of Trent. Right? He becomes very famous because the the Catholic Church, the Ultramont no, not the Ultramont, well I guess they were Ultramont. The Catholic Church wanted to impose on Venice what they imposed on every other nation on the globe, or every other city state on the globe, is that they elect the clergy in the city. There was a brawl which was, uh, right, and God knows it was probably somebody inside the church who decided to set up this brawl, both sides of the church, right. Anyway, Sarpi becomes the defender of Venice against the imposition of the clergy by the papacy inside Venice, right. He becomes the, the, the lawyer, right, because he had written an attack on the Council of Trent and the corruption on the Council of Trent. Okay. Yeah, yeah, there is actually. Um, it became, in fact, it was first translated into English <coughs> because it was the English under Sir Henry Wooten who translated his attack on the Council of Trent because the English had broken from the Catholic Church. They set up their own Anglican Church and they were in a brawl. So Sarpy becomes the Uh, uh, leader of the English in their attack on the church. He's first translated into English this attack. Who is his close ally? Listen to this. 
Thomas Hobbes. <laughs> and Thomas Hobbes writes the Leviathan. Mm -hmm. And it's the first official attempt at establishing a nation that had no relationship to God. Right? No relationship to higher truth. Based on hedonistic principles of whoever's got the power to rule is the legitimate ruler. That legitimacy comes from a social contract. That since, it's, since humanity is the war of each against all, short, brutish, I mean, you know, life is short, brutish, and something else. Does anyone remember the quote? Nasty, brutish. Nasty, brutish, and short. Which, by the way, was a description of, of, uh, of Henry Kissinger, actually. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but anyway, it was a social contract theory, right? How, where does it come from? Paulo Sarpi. Paulo Sarpi establishes even worse than Aristotle empiricism. Paulo Sarpi is the first writer of empiricism and the theory of empiricism. Right? In which he says there are no traditions, there are nothing in your mind. Right? This becomes later Locke in the Tabula Rasa. Right? It's only the impressions of the of the of, of your senses, right? That's science. That became Bacon. He's close to Bacon. Mm -hmm. And English so called English science and empiricism. Right? You also Paulo Peruta becomes the first guy who said uh, food uh, population outstrips food. Because population grows. No, Jim, Jim, John Maria Ortiz was a, a Venetian who said population grows geometrically, food only grows arithmetically. <laughs> which was later Malthus's order. Right. That was Malthus. Right. So, so uh, John Maria Ortiz. Right. O R T E S. Right. Who is Hobbes the spokesman for besides the Venetians, right? He becomes the spokesman for Oliver Cromwell and the overthrowing of the English crown who thoroughly deserved to be overthrown. But you see, Venice, they don't give a shit. Crown, no crown, you know, good guy, bad guy, as long as it's not human. You know, we're with it, right? Uh, so Hobbes, the Leviathan, is a nation without legitimacy. The legitimacy comes from power. That is the argument of Hobbes. Hmm? It's straight Venice. The other side of the thing, which Lynn puts great story, is Galileo's attack on Kepler. Galileo and Sarpi were close friends. They were both out of Venice at the time. And in fact, uh, what somebody pointed out to me is that Kepler had sent his work to Galileo and asked for comment. And Galileo never made any comment on Kepler's work. Right. He sent him a letter. He sent him a letter? Yeah. Oh, okay, well, who's got it? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm, sure it was, I'm sure it was bullshit, but anyway. Uh, that's interesting. We should, we should look into it. Uh, okay. Now, what, what was Sarpy doing? And what was this empiricism and later the Enlightenment? What was it, really? Right? Sarpy and the Nuovi realized that they had to adapt to science, otherwise it would be destroyed. Right? I mean, it was just simple. The modern world was going to go ahead with this thing. The, 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 the cat was out of the bag. It was going to happen. Right? And therefore, how do you destroy science while getting the fruits of science? Hmm? Algebra. <laughs> 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 so 
reduce everything to a formula where you get a result but never how you came to that hypothesis. Hmm? This is engineering school today. These poor guys are still suffering because of Paolo Sarpi. If they want to spring up, they're pissed off. They should have make dolls of Paolo Sarpi and start sticking them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason. That is the reason. And Galileo and, the, and Bacon and this other crowd. That is, but they had to appropriate the fruits of science without the concept of man, which you can't do. Hmm? Okay. So this abomination, by, and you're talking about 1640, 1630, 1640, becomes the dominant philosophical tendency inside Brittany directly. Now, more interestingly, right, the actual banking system, Venice survived another way, which no one talks about. They could not compete physically with Britain or the Netherlands. So they set up an international monetary system using gold and silver. And they speculated the only production they had was gold mines and silver mines. And the only routes they protected was gold and silver routes. And they set up arbitrage and different, differing relations between gold and silver. So they survived epistemologically, right? And also physically, not as a physical power, but an intelligence power, based upon central banking and the manipulation of hard currency, which is the only currency that there was, right? That's how they survived. Okay, now the plot thickens, mm -hmm. right? Then we get to the first point of our discussion this morning, right? After Cromwell was defeated, and he was defeated, um, you had Charles II, Charles I was beheaded, Cromwell came into power. Charles II, the restoration was, I mean, again, nobody's really good in this, uh, you know, except for a couple of people. Nobody's, don't look for the good guys and the bad guys. You'll get totally confused. Right? Charles was a uh, was lunatic, right? But he was a king. Uh, and also uh, James. Charles was a Protestant, well, Charles was okay with Protestantism. James was not. He got manipulated and decided they had to go back to Catholicism. So he was overthrown. Right? And who comes in? And this is where the American Revolution actually starts. Right? Who comes in is, as I said, William and Mary. As, a, as the overthrowing of James II. Right? Who brings him in? Literally, the Venetian party of England was later called by Disraeli the Venetian party of England. Right? Who were they? The Whig grandees. The Whig uh, holders, landholders. Right? This was, uh, and as, as Graham goes through, under George I, right, who was the first um, uh, German Hanoverian king, right, was that the the Marlborough was la Churchill Winston Churchill's great 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 great, 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 great grandfather mm -hmm. right the Marlboroughs right mm -hmm. are the ones who invite William into England. They have a coup against the lawful king of. Uh, he's crazy, admittedly, but he was the lawful king of. England, right? The large landholding estates, right, and the stock jobbers and the most corrupt elements of England invite William and Mary into the throne of England. And they take over. In other words, William didn't run anything and died fairly young. George didn't even speak English. 
The first George I did not speak English. He was not an English king. George III spoke English, but he was insane. Right? Right? But then England gets under the domination, as, as Graham points out brilliantly, of the oligarchy of England, where they have been trying to get rid of kings forever. And finally, the, the financial oligarchy of England, right, who was directly connected by slime mold, as a slime mold to Venetian financing, right, begin to loot England to the bone. Hmm? And they start a war with France the second they get in. And this war with France indebted England. And these Whig financial oligarchy took the debt that was accrued by England in the war with France and loaned them the money. That money they loaned became the Bank of England. They became the Bank of England with that money. And then they sold scrip to the, to the other landed oligarchy of England. And the, then, they loot, then they ran the treasury. And they paid 100%, 110%. Hmm? 10% on this stuff and and they kept looting the treasury and this was the first central official essential bank of a nation central banking based on what not the government there was no government they brought in a, a other so called king who was not a king at least William spoke a little English not a lot George I spoke no English right to sit there while the financial oligarchy determined the monetary system. Who was the first secre secretary of the Mint? Isaac Newton. <laughs> Under this arrangement. Isaac Newton. All ideology. All Venetian ideology. Right? That this later becomes the British East India Company with Walpole the, the next under George I Walpole takes over but as Graham documents as a reaction to the total corruption and takeover of England by the Venetian party by the literally the oligarchical forces which get rid of the king it's just a, a figurehead at this point right except Anne does some very interesting things as Graham points out, because because Anne was not just a puppet, mm -hmm. and she worked with Lord Harley and a bunch of uh, Swift and others, they created an opening, a very brief opening, in which those like Cotton Mather, Increase Mather, and those <coughs> were prepared to jump on that opening, and Spotswood and Hunter, who were actually uh, uh, put in there, right? But it was based upon a reaction. The American Revolution was based on a reaction to Anglo-Dutch liberalism, literally. Hmm? And Ben Franklin, as did Cotton Mather and Increase Mather, created their own lawful money inside the United States, coined their own money. Because they knew that this system was going to kill them. And they created their own credit and their own money. Of course, that was stopped later. right? And by George III, they had realized... As because the British East India Company directly took over, right? And there's a longer story which I'm not going to go through because this will take another two hours. Mm -hmm. um, they, the American Revolution, based upon the idea of money as a way of circulating the wealth and developing the wealth of the nation by a central government committed to the general welfare of the population was established on these shores even before Alexander Hamilton as an impulse tendency. This is what Lynn said. Which side are you on? Simple. Economics is fairly simple. Mm -hmm. It's which side are you on? Are you on the looters? Are you with the, 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 the oligarchy? We know where that leads. The problem with it is we know where that leads. 
in India. One third of the population of India was wiped out by the British East India Company directly through famine. One third of the population of China was wiped out through the Opium Wars. Hmm? British colonialism was a disaster. It was run by these spores. What Lynn says is that what you have are these slime molds, replications of Venetian banking, right, to loot the population, as opposed to a Commonwealth view or an American system view, which was actually a reaction to Anglo-Dutch liberalism. It didn't occur outside of that. That's why I went through all this history. Hmm? It was literally that. So we have to return ourselves to the American system and get rid of this Venetian abomination. So, that's what I have. Mm-hmm. Any questions? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about this? I'll make you a deal. <laughs> I'll get into a little of it. Uh, but I'm sure we're going to be having a cadre school next time. <coughs> Why don't I... I mean, I did go through a thousand years of history. Uh, <laughs> this is from 800 to 1800. All right, I gypped you out of 100 years. <laughs> Uh, but anyway uh, next time I'll actually why don't, why don't I do that next time the only thing I will say which uh, I would recommend people read Graham's book yeah. Yeah. I mean really you, you. this is so beautiful this is so you know I really when Lynn said you know what a loss we have there's not going to be another historian like him except maybe in your generation certainly not in mine I mean, really, it's not going to happen. Okay, this is a guy who, this was living history. This was a drama. You'll never forget it. One of the best written histories I've ever read in my life. And I have read a lot of histories. Okay. Uh, uh, so I recommend you do that. I also recommend for the short course, okay, for the cliff notes on this thing, uh, read the, uh, which I did for this discussion, it was quite brilliant, this Palmerston panel in 1994. The, the Palmerston Zoo. This panel was brilliant. I mean, I participated in it, but the, 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 uh, Graham speaks on this question. Jeff speaks on this question. Some very strange people speak. This <laughs> this but anyway. Uh, Where did you read that? It's called, the, in 1994, it's called the Palmerston Zoo. What's in this, uh, EIR. Al Douglas paper that you wrote. Oh, yes. I'll, I'll get that for you. I'll zero. It's magnificent. Is it in the alpha? Yeah, it's 19... Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I have it. I'll send it out to you. I think it's 1992. ALD. <laughs> I think. Don't don't quote me on that. I'll, I'll, I'll find out. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on uh, Thomas Hobbes being the spokesman for all the farm law and this whole English civil war. Yeah, yeah, this is something. This is quite a story. Um, uh, I got a, in a lot of trouble on this one. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, Look, it, again, the, the problem is don't look for good guys and bad guys. If you look for good guys and bad guys, you're going to get confused, right? The Venetians wanted at that point to bring in a, a grouping of oligarchs. They wanted an oligarchical form of government, right? not a king. Okay? Because someday a king might emerge like Henry VII. You always had the danger. It's sort of like, why, didn't they wa- why did they spend all their money to destroy Franklin Roosevelt after he died? Because America could generate potentially another Franklin Roosevelt. Mm. So they wanted to extirpate even the possibility of another Franklin Roosevelt or another king like Henry VII. 
or someone who would have power to do something other than what they wanted, right? As oligarchical interests, right? So, uh, uh, you know, uh, Charles the First was a lunatic. Problem was a lunatic, right? He beheaded Charles, but the irony of ironies, because of the renaissance that occurred in England there were people who in the reformed church who were real human beings <laughs> there were Puritans who were real human beings there were the actually the beautiful story in our own EIR of the pilgrims they were real human beings if you read Cotton Mather which I did read his essays to do good it's very difficult to read yeah, right. yeah. this is a serious what they call muscular Christianity, right? That's, that's the word. That's the way it's described. A muscular Christianity, right? you know, where where the question comes, says you should do good. You should good to, do good to your neighbor. You should do good to your wife. You should do good to your magistrates. You should do good. That's not this faith, you know, and, and no and no works, right? That's a very different proposition. It's real Christianity. Right. That's how they that's how they came up with this monetary system. You can generate monetary systems. If you're trying to do the good and the monetary system is in the way, then the monetary system goes. Right? I mean it's really on one level fairly simple. Right? But you have to have a sense of man, who man is. That's why Lynn constantly stresses this question. Well what is humanity? What's the nature of humanity? It's in the capital budget, that's the core of the question. Right. So Cromwell is a lunatic, but he opens up the door to something that the Venetians didn't control. Where does it land? On these shores. On these shores. And the Venetians go wild. But they can't beat us. Because we got swift you've got Queen Anne who opens up the door a bit right got Leibniz the only reason they didn't kill Queen Anne immediately is that they can't kill Queen Anne Sophie <laughs> would come in who was Leibniz yeah. and her top advisor was Godfrey Leibniz <laughs> so Leibniz would have been the Prime Minister of England now that would have been a problem <laughs> so, so they decided we got to I mean, what Graham points out is Anne is dead within two months of Sophie dying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anne was dead within two months of Sophie dying. Because she was the next in line, by not by succession, but by an order that they had agreed to. Right? So, so it's a complicated thing. Right? But it opens the door. So we've got to be thankful for that. It opens the door. To other other way, real Christianity, not the ultramontane Venetian crap, right? But real Christianity, because they're real human beings, and there was really a Renaissance inside England, and these people are trained by Shakespeare, they're trained by Collet, they're trained by by uh, uh, Thomas More, they train, the schools train, them. and then later Shakespeare trains them in statecraft, right? And they and they they establish on this. I, I, I think it, it is called muscular Christianity. If you read if you read essays to do good, it's a very muscular Christianity. They don't take any shit from kings, <laughs> <laughs> and they sure don't take any shit from oligarchs, which is why we have no oligarchs here. Yeah. That's muscular Christianity. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, when I get the, the and, and you started to get at this idea in terms of uh, what you said about algebra, but um, what about Lynn, Lynn brings this up. I have quite digested it. Um, but you know, the capital budgeting paper, the, the role of language oh, yeah. in, uh, in globalization in terms of the need to destroy sovereign language cultures. Well, this is why I try to do a little poetry once in a while. <laughs> it's almost banned, but anyway. Because uh, you know, it, it's, nobody can read it. I can't read it. If you, if you notice, I've never tried to read poetry to anybody. Uh, there's a reason why. Um, but... <laughs> but I wanted to give people a sense 
of how language can convey a concept musically, right, that you could convey in no other way. Hmm? I mean, the spoken word, the sung word, conveys something, and that's why it's so important, the work you're doing on the Yezu, right, and the Ave Vera. Hmm? Because, because it shows the power of language to evoke humanity. Hmm? If you notice, I used some irony here today. Right? Mm-hmm. Understatement. Right? Because that's the only way you can convey the concept. There's no other way to convey it. Humor. There's no other way to convey it. Right? So, so, so that's, that's why they're so terrified of language. What, what do you think they... they at every level, they're scared of Lynn. Because he's one of the humorous, most humorous men who ever lived. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True humor. So, yeah, I, I, you know, there's a lot. I mean, that is a, a, a subject. Maybe someday I'll, I'll give her something on that. Taking the Dante de Volcari eloquentia, which is something that, you know, you guys. Does anybody speak Italian here, by the way? Anybody? Italian? Oh, you do? Great. Well, th- this is your kind of... This would be perfect for you, the, the Vulgari Eloquentia. It really would be. Uh, and I know Megan wants to work on it, so maybe the two of you could just look into it. Uh, yeah, I promise, Matt. Matt, did you have a question? Oh, um, yeah, because what you were saying about... Uh, I just want the thing that struck me in Lynn's capital budget paper uh, was how just again and again and again he says outright um, he's got these whole sections about how you have to organize the citizens of your republic and he's got this one thing in there about um, how you have to make sure that your citizens are all conscious of what the boundary condition is in the present economy that they all have to be on a mission to overcome. And that's the passion that your citizens have to have to do good to overcome that boundary condition. And um, uh, just in the context of all this, what you're saying about um, the organizing uh, into the into the American system and stuff like that, I just wondered if you could go into that a little bit from the standpoint of really organizing. It was just well, look, it's so me. obvious. It's so obvious. Look at Cotton Mather and Increased Mather. Mm-hmm. This system, if the American Revolution hadn't happened, this system would have gone into complete collapse by 1820. Total collapse. The only, one of the ironies is the only reason there's a planet of six billion people today is because of the American system. Because they actually did have the passion to overcome this system. The, the agrarian, anti-industrial... Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. They, they had the passion to do it. Mm-hmm. They saw it as the boundary. They didn't have a choice. Mm-hmm. This was something increased in Cotton Mather that said, oh, gee, wouldn't it be nice to create a new monitor? <laughs> <You know? laughs> they said, my God, these guys are lunatics. They're going to have to kill us. Are we going to sit down and take that? Hey, we're muscular Christians. <laughs> 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 we don't have to take that stuff and they didn't and they, uh, their passion was to do good and so that's that's how it was it's a beautiful story it's an incredible story and only Graham could tell it I'm not going to tell that story read Graham I'll tell other stories but I won't tell that one yeah can you uh, develop some of Shakespeare's method of the statecraft <laughs> I gave like three classes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, let me do it in a different way. Um, let me give you a concrete example of how it worked, okay? And that's in the in uh, the education of Abraham Lincoln, right? Because. Uh, in the article I wrote on this, it's called Abraham Lincoln, Shakespeare's Revenge. Right? <laughs> this is true. This is not, again, this is all on the record. Right? 
Yeah. No, it was New Federalist years ago. I don't know. I don't even remember when, but it was a long time ago. Um, okay, now, what was Lincoln's... Lincoln was not a, quote, college-educated man. I mean, he went to college, he went to law school, but he was he, he had two things. The King James Version of the Bible, and he's explicit on that because of the language, and Shakespeare. <laughs> okay, those are the two things he had. Now, what was his favorite play? Of all things, Macbeth. I said, I, of all the plays, I mean, I could, this is one dark, <laughs> you know, this is one dark play. I mean, this is, this is, why did he focus on Macbeth? Because, what is Macbeth, what is the subject of Macbeth? A great hero who defends the nation becomes a monster beyond his own recognition. As Macbeth says at the end, I don't even recognize myself. Because of the ambition and the and worse, the treason based upon the ambition. Right? I don't even recognize myself. Remind you of the South? Mm-hmm. Certainly did Lincoln. Great war heroes who commit treason based upon ambition who do not recognize themselves, cannot recognize themselves. And he understood you cannot make a deal with this thing. Why was he able to prosecute the war in a way that only Grant and Sherman were capable of doing? He understood through Shakespeare what was at stake. He understood the mind of the enemy who was not evil to begin with but once they commit treason there is no evil that they would not commit in commission of treason. And therefore they must it was total war and they had to be destroyed not out of hate but out of love for humanity. That's Shakespeare. And that's Shakespeare's revenge. That's how statecraft is committed is 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 actually transmitted through culture. That's what Lynn means by it's transmitted through culture. Hmm? Often you you have these images of people you've known or things you've read. That, so in times of trouble you turn to them because you've thought it through and you act on that basis. That's culture. That's what it is. And the more wellsprings you have of that, the more capable you are of acting under those crisis conditions. So it works. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I wanted you to highlight some uh, some of the, the like relationship between the secession of the apostolic culture yeah. that led up to Kuza specifically in the Council of Florence. Yeah. Right, and highlight the anti the, the anti ultramontane, you know, um, circles within the church. Well uh yeah, did you do you oh, want to no, follow no, on that? No, no. Okay, yeah. Uh it's a long question. I, I think the best way to think about it, from a, very specifically what you asked is uh, a paper that Paul Gallagher wrote uh, on the question of how was Europe Christianized, right? Because there was a very specific process by which Europe ultimately did physically eclipse and mentally eclipse the, the Muslim world. But it wasn't until later. It wasn't until really uh, the, the Renaissance itself. Right. So, you, you, so, but but there was an impulse tendency by what was the Augustinian teaching orders, right, that actually Christianized Europe in an apostolic fashion. They were deployed against by the Benedictine orders, right, out of Cluny and the Ultramontane, right, and and then later these Crusader orders, right. But they were counter deployed against by Rabelais. 
like it's in the tradition of Jonathan Swift. This was one tough guy, <laughs> Jonathan Swift. Right? We have our guys always had humor, right? <laughs> always had irony, right? Uh, you know, St. Patrick, Columba, Columbine had irony. In fact, I was told that uh, uh, St. Patrick, and this goes to this language question, really learned the language of the Saxons and the stories of the Saxons to convey mm -hmm. the, the concepts of Christianity, right? So our guys had, had weapons our enemies do not have, and have always had weapons our enemies don't have. You know, so uh, that's in sketch, but what I would recommend, does anybody know where the Gallagher paper is? You know where the Gallagher paper is. Can you get it? Yeah, how Irish Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. It's a book. No, no, that's a different one, yeah. But Gallagher wrote a paper, something like that. What's it called? It's it's I think it's a review of the book, but Paul... No, no, this is better. He's got... He's got yeah, he, he, uh, yeah, he, he wrote. wrote an article yeah, on but that's, that's, in that sense, that's the story. So I would recommend you do that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if you could... No, I, actually I was... Uh, this one, yeah, I had a question. Uh, I missed what you said about the Vikings. Like, who... Um, <laughs> yeah. Like, who deployed them? And, like, what were the... Uh, Interesting. Uh, well, you know, the Vikings... Um, uh, came from Scandinavia. Uh, they uh, were basically nomadic tribes from Scandinavia. You know what I mean? They, they were nomads. They, they wandered. They, they didn't really farm. They fished a bit, but they mainly looted. Right? Uh, and I'm sure that's a degeneration of a previous culture. I just don't know the story. I mean, you don't end up fish looting. <laughs> uh, you don't start that way. You know. <laughs> hey, let's loot. You know, it's not human, right? Uh, I, I, I'm sure it's, it's. I'm sure there was a higher culture at one point in that area of the world, right? And that degenerated. What you, what you were seeing in the Vikings is the degeneration. I'm sure of a higher culture and a higher language. Uh, I'm sure of it. I just don't know the story. But 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 th they were deployed by the Venetians uh, because the Venetians ran their trading routes. They they also brought stuff. They, as they stole things, they had to fence it. Okay, they needed a fence, right? The Venetians were their fence. They, they'd steal it and give it to the Venetians. The Venetians give them money or food. I don't know what they did, right? And uh, but but that was the the, the combination. So that's. I'm sorry, I don't know that, but if you're interested in it, there's ways of, of researching it. Uh, let's see, yeah. Do you, do you know how, I was wondering, how did the Normans get deployed to the Crusades? Were they Christian? They yeah, Christian? yeah, they were, by then they had become Christian. Huh. But, you know, what are you, you going to say, you know? Uh, they were probably committing so many sins. <laughs> well, actually, they were, they were, first of all, the Venetians were telling him, look, you can loot the hell out of the place and there's a lot of wealth there. That's how the, all the Venetian, all the Norman lords had become Christians because they thought they could get rich with the, with the, okay, of the church. So this, as I said, this is not muscular Christianity. This is just lunacy. lunacy. But uh, that, that's who they were. They, they, they're not, as I said, except for this one guy, they're mainly an embarrassment, you know, I mean, nobody really brags about Norman culture. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy did. But yeah. One guy. I, I have two questions. Sure. One is uh, the, uh, the sort of relationship between the uh, Venetian and the Chinese. Because yeah. I read, uh, I think it was a pamphlet called Venetian. That we put out. Yeah, Marco Polo. Yeah, he talks a lot about talks a little bit about that relationship, but I, I've never really had a much more deeper insight. Yeah, I, I mean, again, Gallagher does a very interesting thing in Fidelio. He did a lot of this work on the eastern side of the thing. There was a famous Venetian by the name of Marco Polo. He was Venetian, right? right? Uh, and and speaks of the Silk Road and the cultures. But they basically, the way the Venetians work is they would profile a country. 
uh, some of the most fascinating reading I've ever had in terms of intelligence was the profiles that the Venetian ambassadors wrote at every court in Europe and in the East. In other words, what they did was they sent um, their, their, their oligarch. These were oligarch sons, right? With, with the Venetian ambassadors court. Remember the famous Holbein, you may have seen this, Holbein writes the ambassadors and there's a death's head, right? Those are two Venetians. Right. The Venetian ambassador corps was profiling everything in Europe, everything in Asia, every government, the Turks, every force that could be. Because they had to trade with every single one of these courts. Right? So what the, what the Venetians would do, Marco Polo being one of them, would write profiles of the different countries and how you could play one against the other. What was the weakness? They obviously realized Henry VIII had a weakness. Okay, I mean for the ladies, he had a weakness. Okay, and uh, and they figured that out fairly early on, uh, uh, and they they dangled some bait out there, and you know, it was he was a goner at that point. Um, this is one of the problems. They do they profile every single court, every single person in court. He, they were master profiles, right? And therefore, they profile the Chinese court. They profile the Seljuk Turk court. They they profile the different court. They profile the Attila the Hun. <laughs> they profiled uh, what's his name, Genghis Khan. After the fact, no, no. Why was going on? They were they were trading with Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan. They traded with everybody. You know, yes. yeah. Another question I had is how how do you read Shiro's Shur, Thirty Years War? Uh, because I've read it already, and it seems like the thing that jumps jumps out to you is the real fact about the uh, sort of the the <coughs> effects of Con Constantine on his giving the land, and the whole broad seems to be about land, but it on how to find this group. Well, because uh, again, this this uh, we have a lot of work to do on this Netherlands side of the thing. All we know, which is why I stress this, thing, William of Orange was from the Netherlands. The William of William and Mary was from that area, right? And he was brought in by the Venetians to run the Venetian faction inside England to run England, right? So. Yeah, the donation of Constantine. I mean, we just don't know the story. I, I can't purport to know the story. I just don't know the story. Uh, uh, and one of, you know, Schiller made this very interesting comment, which I've always been fascinated with. Because uh, at first it seems, it's so ironic, it, 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 it's just hard to believe. He says, you will never have another poet like Shakespeare nor will you have another Homer. Right? But, in naive and sentimental poetry, but he says, there is a way you could get at the same point by doing what he called sentimental, maybe that's a bad, but sentient or philosophical. Right? Uh, you can get at the same point that Shakespeare and Homer got at in this totally sensual way. And I've always wondered, what, what could he possibly mean by that? And I think I understand it. After a certain point, after the Renaissance, European history becomes super complicated and super complex. Okay? Up until that point, there were individuals that could individually run history. I think it, if Schiller had lived later, you could write a, a, a fantastic drama about... about uh, Frankly, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Hamilton, he just didn't know them that well, right? Uh, but, uh, yeah, someday, anyway. Uh, so the point being, uh, this, I think the best way to think about both the Thirty Years' War and Schiller's writings is these were, and Wallenstein, these were all preludes to the plays Don Carlo, Maria Stewart, 
Wallenstein, take them as one elaboration of that period, as one strategic study, hmm? based upon the revolt of the Netherlands and the Thirty Years' War, right? And then you'll get at it. That's the actual history, as Schiller saw it, and he was the, one of the most brilliant historians, if not the most brilliant historian that ever lived. Which is why he had to write drama. Not an accident. No, it's not arbitrary. He didn't intend to be a dramatist. He was a historian. He sat at the chair of history and in, uh, in Jena. That's what he was. But it, it, to, to convey real history, it has to be classical drama. Because you can't convey it any other way. That's why I always go to Shakespeare or Schiller or someone else to get at the point. So I, I think that's the way to look at it. The best I can do anyway. Yeah. I just wanted you to clarify the you know the British East India Company? Yeah. And how that's connected to the Venetian Empire? Oh sure. Because the I was doing a bit of study a couple of years ago and apparently the British East India Company were doing investi uh, navigation here. And the Hawaiian flag is the British East India Company's flag. Right, sure, sure. And I just wanted to know well, more about it. Well, see, you get, a, you get a couple of ratchets down. You know, once the William and Mary come in, and then you get the Hanoverian kings. Uh, see, the, the, you get a total corruption, as you have today in America. Total looting. Right, uh, like Halliburton, mm -hmm. they, there's nothing stopping them. You know, like the IMF, World Bank. You know, you, you, you just get a total devolution, right? So the British East India Company was uh, part of the uh, uh, series of companies which flowed off the Bank of England, right? In which it was a return to an Anglo-Dutch liberal Venetian empire it was Venetian in the sense of looting these countries for financial interests hmm? that's what it was now you couldn't have gotten that unless you had a total breakdown of any kingship and you were going for a globalized empire under the Venetian Venetian model globalized empire. Hmm? That, that's what they were going for at that point. Now, because it was so bad, America was created. As, as, as Matthew said, I thought his question was very well taken. Right? They had no choice. We had no choice. This was not a good idea. This was survival. America had no choice but to break with England and the British East India Company. You want to know the irony? You know the famous British tea that came to the United States that so-called sparked the revolution in Boston? It's British East India Company tea. They were, at, they were importing it from um, India to Boston. And nobody was going to drink that tea because they would have to pay an excise tariff on it. So they were going to make them pay the excise tariff anyway to pay the British East India Company. So people jumped the ship and there was quite a tea party in the Boston Harbor at that point. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. That's, that's what happened. It was, it was British East India Company tea. And they were going to start imposing British East India Company looting on the United States and they said okay, you want, you're going to charge us for the tea? It's not going to disembark. It's going to be thrown in the harbor. And they dressed up as Indians. <laughs> you know, to do it. They had a sense of humor in those days. <laughs> 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 yeah. But you say there's more on the uh, idea of no works, um, only fake, that came out of the uh, Protestant Reformation. The yeah, sure, yeah. Then, uh, and the connection with that and the Puritans. Well, you see, the Puritans are a complicated matter, right? As I said, many Puritans came here and they had what I call the muscular Christianity. Works, buddy. In fact, in fact, it was very interesting on this because uh, 
Uh, Richard Welch did a very interesting uh, piece on the famous Tempest, the play of Shakespeare. Uh, and uh, they were coming to Virginia when uh, the, the, sto- the actual story that, that uh, inspired the Tempest was they were coming to Virginia and the boat sank, right? And then he takes off from there. It was a very famous... Right? What were they doing? These were Augustinian orders. The only thing you absolutely must do if you're part of the Augustinian order is work. Mm-hmm. By the sweat of your brow, your bread shall be earned. Mm-hmm. Right? That, that, there was no question on that. <laughs> right? And if you notice in the Tempest, mm-hmm. what was Caliban's... What was Caliban totally pissed off about? That Prospero made him work. <laughs> right, he was the original hippie, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? This was the terrible burden. He wanted to drink, uh-huh. as Trinculo found out, right? Uh, so so the, this question of salvation through works, right? as an affirmation of your faith was the real apostolic Christianity. But the spirituality also, look, these fundies are both in the Catholic Church and in the, and all the Protestant churches. They're fundies in the Catholic Church. They're about as bad as anyone else. Right? You know. So that's, that's sort of the split. And the Puritans, as I said, were a very complicated question. Because many Puritans came here. Increased matter, you know, uh, uh, cotton matter for Puritans. Winter, huh? Winter, Winter, Puritans. So, you know, as I said, humans are, but what they really were, forget about giving them a label, what they really were, were the offshoot of the English Renaissance and an idea of man. Right? There was a misnomer to call them Puritans, they were Republicans. Uh, do you know if these guys brought any Shakespeare over to the original? I'm sure they did. I, I, there's no way they didn't. Yeah. Although it got pretty weird because they, they banned Shakespeare too. So oh, no. yeah, yeah, they banned Shakespeare. First they tried to bodlerize him. Literally, this guy's bodler. They, they, they tried to, <laughs> <laughs> in which they tried to take out all the political and related mm. implications. Uh, bodler, this guy bodler. <laughs> polarization and he tried to take all the good parts out of Shakespeare right? uh, uh, everything polemical they took anything that might offend the restoration king he was goofy I mean there's a lot of goofy things in him right? okay and then that didn't work so Pope tried to rhyme Shakespeare rhyming couplets they changed the language to make it rhyming couplets which was really stupid right uh so therefore, the irony is, of course, Shakespeare comes back through the German translations. You couldn't get Shakespeare in English after the Restoration. You couldn't do it in English. They were just screwing it up. I mean, they were literally rewriting the thing. Sort of like these Hollywood plays, you know, just uh, Hollywood rewrites. You know. uh, so it's pure entertainment. The, the, the real ironies, the real devastating ironies were taken out. So it was, wasn't until... Shakespeare was retranslated into German by Lessing, by the group around Lessing, and re- and played by Goethe and Schiller in German, in literate German, that the Shakespeare got revived back into English. Wow. He was so hot. <laughs> he, he was so devastating right, that they, they wouldn't touch him. <laughs> they were too frightened of him. But the Germans, during this Republican revival with Kestner and then you know, the people around Kestner, you know, they, they revived Shakespeare. Schiller revived Shakespeare. Right? Goethe revived Shakespeare. And then when? It's been a long... And this is his 400 something of his death. I think. Death or birth? It's 400th anniversary of something. Death. The 400th anniversary of his death. And I don't know what to do. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen a Shakespeare play. Uh, it is so bad. It is so disgusting. 
They try to do it in modern costume. This is the, all the rage in 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 uh, in Hollywood, but but not just Hollywood. It's all the rage in in Washington. You know, I used to, I, you know, I was desperate. You know, I said, all right, well at least I'll hear the language. I couldn't even stand it. They, they just started doing it in modern dress, and it was so bad. And we, you know, it's historically specific. It was so bad. I said, oh. I, I, I'm not even going to try it. I'll just read it myself, and, <laughs> and hopefully someday we'll revive it. Yeah, Betiana. Yeah, um, I was like, um, I I really I've been trying to understand uh, this crusade process. Yeah. Like, um, how is it possible that they this ultramontan system was establishing a economic and and political system with the crusades? That was actually that they know they knew it was gonna be self-destructive. Well, you see, they don't. They don't believe. It. Look, as I said, that's why we can't really give the oligarchs big credit. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I'm thinking because it it makes me think that actually they are more like their minds is acting like existentialist teenagers. And <laughs> <laughs> so how how is it possible that? Uh, it's the same situation we have today with Bush and everything that's happening with Cheney. Sure, sure. So how, how but it's the British. You see, this is why Lynn has said, this is not Bush, this is not Cheney. Remember what Lynn says it's the British? I hope you understand that a little bit differently before, after today's discussion. The British are the Venetians. They're capable of anything. Hmm? They would rather the world be destroyed and go down to one billion people than admit humanity exists. And we are much in the same situation as Lincoln. We don't fight this war because we want to fight war. We have no choice. There is no choice. They, they, they really are as crazy as they seem to be. They really are. And this is what Lynn says. They ripped up their card, their, yeah. their membership card in humanity. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's through Shakespeare that you, you're going to be able to uh, understand how their minds are working. So you can no, that was for Lincoln. Radical? No, no, no. That, that's, that's, that was Lincoln's way of understanding. That, that was the question. How, yeah. did, how did this work? Lynn. No, no. Oh, no, no, no. no. We, you know. I mean, Lynn... Yeah. You know, Lynn doesn't say Lynn, but I can say Lynn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really, really yeah, 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 yeah. It's Lynn. It's mm -hmm. Lynn. The, you know, he won't say that, but I can say that. <laughs> you know. Jerry no, no, no. Well, you know, it's it's interesting. I was thinking about that. You know, um, is the best I can do right now, because you see, here's your problem. You've got two levels always functioning when you study history. You've got the visible, right, which which you can, which which at the boundary conditions you can say something fairly decisive, right, because they can't totally avoid reality, right. So at boundary like 1509, when the Venetians almost got wiped out, physically annihilated, this was a big thing for them, right? I mean, you know that, right? That's one benchmark or characteristic or boundary condition, right? Then the Renaissance was a big boundary condition, and you see their reaction to that, right? In a sense, you can see it almost as a reaction to the development of humanity mm -hmm. after the Renaissance, not before, but after. Okay, now it wasn't particular to England except for the fact that England and the Netherlands had large fleets and were not only competing with the Venetians but out competing the Venetians and were moving into the Levant and the eastern areas, right? Uh, so, in a sense, the Venetians. Intelligence service. This is where the invisible side of the thing comes, right? Or as you, once you read, if you've ever read a Venetian ambassador's report, right, you'll know 
what you're dealing with here. Okay, and if you read Schiller's Ghost Seer, you'll know what you're dealing with here, right? Uh, their intelligence reports would tell them Britain is a powerful competitor. Britain has to be destroyed or taken over, as would be the Netherlands, right? Now, they didn't have the physical power anymore. They certainly couldn't take it over by land. They had no military power to take it over by land. So they had to do what they always do, get Britain to destroy itself from the inside. Profile it. Destroy it from the inside. And make sure that your faction that agrees with your perspective, that is part of your banking system, not your mercantile system, because they never mercantile system was being destroyed. Your banking system, those who are attached to that as part of your slime mold, right? Those are the guys who have to come to power. I, I think it's something like that. Hard to document. Although in principle it's, it's a dynamic. And therefore you can say with great force, this was the dynamic. I think that's the best way to, that's what we can do. Anyway. Graham, yeah. Graham goes through a lot of how this stuff worked in the uh, in his book. Yeah. Yeah, well, Graham is unbelievable. But he doesn't go specifically through the Venetians per se. That's, that's I think, what, what she was asking. Um, but, I, uh, you know, anyway. Well, on this, on this question of the British question, like today, in my mind at least, the, uh, the British don't really have any political power, uh, you know, at least since the end of World War II. So, you know, LaRouche always references this question of the British, and I'm... I mean, is he being uh, literal, or is he kind of sort of just using that as a historical reference? No, oh no, this is literal. Language? This is literal. Just as the Venetians, mm -hmm. they don't have to have physical power. They what they do is they profile every single culture, <coughs> and they pit through religious warfare, which is their favorite tool, which is Harry, which is mm -hmm. Kissinger, Harrington. Uh, uh, not Harrington, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Huntington. Huntington. Huntington, right? And they have literally the profile of every single tribe and the history of every tribe in that area. And the names of the guys who are still alive today and how to push the levers on this thing. And then they get this Cheney Bush thing, right? Which is not American. Remember, the American establishment has spoken. That's the Baker Hamilton report. Right? They said Iran, Syria, Hamas, Hezbollah, everyone must be brought into the process. That is the American establishment report. Okay? What is this Cheney thing? Simmons, British. And and, and his wife, Lynn Cheney. It's British. Colonialism. Right? So, so no, no. This is how it works. This is not a metaphor. This is this is really how it works. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know these guys um, have tend to get a little uh, extra bloodthirsty, and you know, like in their zealousness, they'll create a Hitler, create a Frankenstein monster that'll get them a lot of hand. Yeah. And uh, even then, it forced them to switch their their procedure and whatnot. And I was wondering today, and it was when I was listening to. Uh, uh, a briefing, and uh, there was a mention that uh, there was a newspaper, London Times, which was giving like almost warnings that this was happening in the Middle East and whatnot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you think that this could have been a Absolutely. Like monster that was? Absolutely. Like Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Absolutely. 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 Mm -hmm. So now the track, you think there's a window of opportunity now that we could? Well, yes, 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 yes. That's how history works. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at this Queen Anne thing. She was under the control totally of the Marlboros and the Gandolfin. Of the uh, you know when when they first came in, she was the daughter of uh, James the no no that was uh, she was the daughter of William and Mary, right? <laughs> and she was totally pushed around in control. At a certain point, she revolted. She said, "Look, I'm the queen. Screw you guys." And then she, because of Harley and Lord Harley and others who were humanists, because of the the there was a humanist faction inside England. She, in 1710, made a break with these guys, fired them, and worked with uh, Swift and Harlan. Right? 
that opened the situation for the United States. That's how we were created. It's really how we were created, right? So yes, there are splits. The French are not particularly thrilled with this one. They're not happy with this. We're in a good situation, right? We're in a good situation. The British are in a weakened situation, so we just got to press the advantage. Yeah. Uh, secondly, uh, the French, in your opinion, do you think strategically of any other? Can you think of off the top of your mind of any other uh, um, forces that work in, in Europe that might be taking this opportunity? Not so much. No, Lynn's very plain on that question. Mm-hmm. He knows the European forces. No, you see, the reason the U.S. thing works is because we mm-hmm. uh, we won on November seventh. Mm-hmm. We won. Not the oligarchy, not a split in the oligarchy. We won. <coughs> they didn't want us to win. Dean didn't want us to win. Most of the Democratic Party didn't want us to win. But we won. Right? And it's because of us. Right? So that is defining the manifold in which the Baker Hamilton, or as Jeff has said very forcefully, as Lynn would say, <coughs> because we won on November 7th, the Baker Hamilton report was the way it was. And if we hadn't won on November 7th, there would have been a totally different Baker Hamilton report. Mm-hmm. The oligarchs are not that great on courage either. Can you go through the um, oh, sure. um, construction of the Haley Burns School? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> the Shelburne, uh, well, mainly the Haley Burns School, and where that, because that seems like the, the intellectual that is. center. Yeah, right, of economics. Of economics. Yeah, sure. 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 Well, Jeff has a, uh, as I said, in this uh, Palmerston Zoo, okay. right? Okay. But uh, look, the way it works, the British East India Company set up a school of so-called philosophers and economists. Uh, it was called the Haleybury School, right? This is where John Stuart Mill uh, uh, and uh, well, John Stuart Mill, John Mill, John Stuart Mill. Huh? The whole family. Yeah, right. And also Adam Smith was before that uh, in the 1776 under Shelburne. Mm-hmm. But anyway, uh, this Haleybury School was connected literally to the British East India Company. And they were arguing not just social contract theory, right? Because that was argued much earlier. But they were arguing that. Uh, um, uh, looting, right, was actual wealth, right? In, in other words, that, that, that uh, the price you got, right, will always go up because you're always using more and more marginal resources. And the price you got would always go up because we're in an entropic universe and we're using up our resources, right? And it was, it was an explicit argument for the need for robbers for each country to have effective looters because that was wealth. Okay, that was the theory behind the Haleyburg School. And Marx bought into it but didn't like the result by saying, well, you can't loot. Or if, Well, actually, it was even crazier. What Marx said was, well, yeah, sure, there is no such thing as wealth. It's only looting from workers, so the workers should loot from the oligarch. <laughs> Dictatorship of the proletariat. <laughs> That's what he meant by the dictatorship of the proletariat. Well, if somebody's got to be looted, why should it be the working class? The working class should loot the, the oligarchs. Didn't he, have, didn't he have the social reproduction theory, though? Something like that. It's complicated. Marx is a lot more competent than the Haleyburg guys. I mean, he had categories of physical production. But what he didn't have which Lynn was very, very clear on, which, which Lynn even is in his criticism of Marx, is he didn't have an idea of extended reproduction. Mm-hmm. He did not have that. Right? That, 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 in fact, the net result of physical production is greater than 100% thermal efficiency. You actually produce a product that corresponds to free energy which Marx did not have. That is the basis for profit and the circulation of profit. Right? Whereas Marx was part of the Haleyburg group. He said, well, if we're going to loot, we might as well have the working class loot the oligarchs. You went to school there, actually? Marx didn't, no. He went, no, he, he was at the library, uh, the British library, but one of the guys 
who was connected to the British East India Company, David Urquhart, was the one who worked with Marx directly uh, and pervade this John Stuart Mill business. Yeah. yeah. I've been reading some uh, Jean-Baptiste Colbert. Oh, great. Political test. Great. And there's something which uh, is kind of annoying is that this guy uh, really likes the king. Like the, the he had to. He had enormous to. devotion to the king. And even at some point, he criticized the parliament, which he finds kind of annoying. Yeah. And that's despite, you know, knowing what the Louis XIV did. Of the well, you know what the problem is? And, and this is what Colbert would tend to do. There's the institution of the king and there's a particular king. It's like the institution of the presidency and the particular presidency. Since you could not have republican form of government right then and there in France, just like Marquis de Lafayette understood this, then what you need is a constitutional monarchy because you couldn't right then and there do that. right? So he was saying compared to the Fronde, compared to the oligarchy, the institution of the king is better than the direct oligarchical rule. I, I, you've got to know that's what Colbert was thinking. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's like somebody said, well, why the hell don't you just chuck Bush out? <coughs> you know? Well, you have to do it constitutionally. Because the institution of the presidency is more important in the continuity of the institution of the presidency than George Bush himself. He's a minor figure. Very minor figure. Cheney, you could dump. There is no institution of the vice president. <laughs> 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 there's a basis because when LaRouche criticizes the Europe as being too much under the dress of the Queen and stuff like that, there's this yes. reaction towards royalty. Sure, sure, but that's not Colbert. <coughs> yes, but that's not Colbert. <laughs> he, he was doing something different because uh, you just know the mind of the man. You know what he was doing. Yeah. He was for the general welfare. So he had to put up with a crappy king because he would be better than the damn oligarchs who would come in underneath the king who was trying to overthrow him. Yeah. Um, my question is on the contemporary oligarchy. Yeah. We can look at people like, like Kissinger, Brzezinski, and so forth. They come from totally different backgrounds. Um, and also if we take the case of the Monte Lavin society, so yeah. if all of these kind of different people, um, they, some seem more extreme, some seem less extreme. And so my question is how, how does the oligarchy carry on their, their legacy? How do they Make well, Lynn calls it the funding. And also, also the kind of this, this idea. How do they the reproduce themselves? Structure, because you're saying how did they, they reproduce the themselves? Had this perfect structure, mm -hmm. like, and you, it seems like people like Schultz and Kissinger, they're on a higher level, like some people in. Yeah, but you, the question you're asking is, how does the oligarchy reproduce itself? Is really the question you're asking, right? Uh, well, they don't reproduce themselves as human. Okay, I mean, in, in other words. Uh, the way they reproduce themselves is they have these fondi, funds that are go into perpetuity. To this day, the Venetians have the Assicuriazione Generale di Venezia. <laughs> to this day, it's the largest reinsurance company in Europe. Okay? These funds recruit sycophants. Hmm? Lawyers, philosophers, general kiss asses, kiss breaches. Right? Right? So, the, so, so the fund is eternal. And the ad administration of the fund and the accretion of the fund, it's like the undead, really. Right? right? Mm -hmm. The accretion of people to the fund, to the fonding, is the way that the oligarchy reproduces itself. When you say, this is just money, forget it, it's over. It's over. This has no magical power. It's just money. We can pr produce it at will. In fact, the government does produce it at will, based upon a, a, a certain thing. If you get rid of Anglo-Dutch liberal banking, and you bankrupt, because every single one of these fondi are now bankrupt, because they all bought into the hedge funds. They lose their power. It's like the wicked witch of the West. Right? You throw water on her, she's gone. Right? <laughs> she shrivels and goes. But what's the organizational structure among these different 
foundations and funds? It, it, it's money. Is there mm -hmm. some formal structure? Like oh, well, yeah, they, men's like clubs. <laughs> really, men's clubs. They, 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 they organize themselves as part of men's clubs. Then they talk to each other. Do you mean like Freemasonry? No, no, that's too low level. I'm talking about like they go to the club and say, why don't we overthrow Somalia? <laughs> you help me overthrow Somalia, I'll help you. Uh, get a couple of billion on your train or something. Right. <laughs> you know. No, no, no. The, the Freemasonry, <laughs> Freemasonry is for the Mickeys, okay? <laughs> you know, the poor guys who, the poor guys who have to do the work. You know, and they say, all right, you tell your Freemasonic Lodge to do this, I'll tell my Freemasonic Lodge to do that. They don't run anything. These are the, marginal. I want to get ahead. You know, I want to kiss some butt. <laughs> Whose butt do I kiss around here? Right? <laughs> the guy's butt. You know, he's, he's got power. You know? and, and then they go around and kiss the guy's butt. You know, and the kiss is just right. You know, then. He doesn't get you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, but I'm just saying that's that's the social organization. It's not great. Okay, philosophers, you know. Professors, they'll write any goddamn thing for money. Mm -hmm. You give them a grant to write anything, and they'll write it because they want to get ahead, right? And and you know it's just that's the way it works. It's no grand conspiracy in that sense. Although at the upper levels, you don't know their names. I assure you, we have no idea who these guys. Are. So when, when, when Larouche says that there's all these faction fights going on in Britain a lot. Thinking that pound or not, that's, yeah. that's exactly what's going on between different uh, different men's clubs. clubs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it, in other words, they don't coordinate that well. If they did, they'd realize it was over and they should work with us because they fucked it up beyond that. <laughs> <laughs> and if anyone was home, they say, "Oh man, we fucked this up. We're gonna have to start this whole thing over again. We blew it." There's 20 trillion or 120 trillion or 200 tr trillion. After, after the first 20 trillion, it's sort of a crapshoot anyway. I mean, 200 trillion, 300 trillion. We fucked this thing up. Who was home? Was anyone home? <laughs> you know? That's, you know, again, don't, over, don't give them... Look, their, their system is over. And under these circumstances, you know, we've got a good shot at it. Because they've they've screwed it up beyond recognition. They don't have a great coordinating body. They, 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 they don't blew have it. A war room. They, they don't have a war room. <laughs> <laughs> Not for them, you know. They have some mickeys. Yeah. Monarchy has no power. Sure, they have no power. Uh, the guys who run their money have power. It's, it's hard to tell. You know, it, um, somebody more expert at that. Look, they have a large fondy. The British oligarchy, the British royal family is a player. Okay? They're a player. They have a large land holdings. They have a big fondy. Right? She's one of the richest people in the world. Um, how that exactly works she's not that bright she's just not that bright Blair is an idiot Charles talked to plants right? uh, you know this is not this is a dysfunctional family right so they ain't running the show if I were to guess maybe nobody's running the show I mean this is so out of control Nobody's running the show, and different people are trying to position themselves for the collapse, which is what this British thing that you reference is. Yeah. What role did Bertrand Russell play? Well, you know, it's interesting. The British, you, you know, the I don't. Have you ever heard this story of Colonel Blimp? Well, there's a character in in, in uh, these uh, Gilbert and Sullivan. Uh, operettas, uh, and there's a Colonel Blimp. He's always the big bumbling colonial 
stupid British oligarch, right? Which was a, was which is a type. It doesn't not aware of anything, totally crass, you know. So Britain had gotten into a, a situation where these Colonel Blimp types had blown it beyond recognition. You know, they killed too many Indians, they killed too many Chinese. The Opium War was even too much for the Crown. You know, to to, to make people grow tea so they could trade it for opium and force the Chinese. This was even too much for Queen Victoria, right? So there had to be a reform of the British system, right? Just a reform to make it more efficient, not to get rid of it, but to make it more efficient. And this became the Fabian Society. This was the Russell and this was H.G. Wells, right? And the Fabian Society was for British reform. It was a, it was a, it was a British reform. It was not a, uh, a change in the system. So Bertrand Russell, who was, uh, I guess, the grandson or the son of Lord Russell of the Fabian Society and the Round Table, uh, uh, was part of the British reform. They were too stupid and too brutal to continue to run the world. Uh, so they, they reformed it. Uh, and again, Bertrand Russell, um, you know, Lynn called the most evil man of the 20th century, mm. which is true because the core of Russell, which was very fundamentally this question of man. What is the nature of man? Hmm? And, and they needed, in each turn of the situation, they had to reestablish that epistemology, otherwise they would lose everything. So I, I think that's sort of the way to look at this. Um, anyway, I, I can talk more informally to people. So that's, that's what I got.